Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Lou Bojarski. Lou is a very accomplished robotics engineer uh, here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Lou, welcome to the pod. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. It's, it's going to be fun. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So uh, you're acting today as a free agent? <laughs> free agent, yeah. yeah. I, my, uh, I currently work for Caterpillar. Been with them for 10 to 12 years. Um, phenomenal. Large enterprise to work for. But yeah, today I am... Uh, I'm here as uh, just a, a robotics engineer in Pittsburgh who's interested in talking to you. And uh, my lawyer actually helped me with that. Uh, nice. <laughs> that entry, yeah. That's awesome. Excited to have you on, Lou. Um, and you've done work for a bunch of robotics companies and like really, really esteemed roboticists here in Pittsburgh. So before we start recording, you were talking about Red Whitaker, Hagen Schempf, uh, who's my program director in the MRSD. And then before Dolan took over, since he was on the podcast, just so people listening aren't confused. And then um, also, um, you've done work for RE Squared, right? Um, yeah. Where else in town have you been? Have you done time I, with Red Zone at all? No, never okay. worked at Red Zone. Never worked at Red Zone. Um, worked for a company where we were looking to partner with Red Zone on cool. some DOE work, but no, never worked. When I was, so I was an undergrad at Carnegie Mellon. I, I don't want to oversell my credentials. I, I was a work study. Um, I, I worked for another professor in the civil engineering department, and he had one too many guys. For the summer, we were oh, we were work studies in yeah. in uh, in the labs and in the shops in the engineering department, and he had one too many guys, and I had the least seniority. So he's like, I can't use you this summer. I'm like, ah, oh, oh. shit. I'm like, oh. he's like, he's like, go talk to Red. He's like, you're odd. you're odd. Go go talk to Red. See if he can use you. <laughs> um, so I worked for Red uh, for a summer. Nice uh, down at Field Robotics on the original lunar well, one of the lunar rover, one of the early lunar rover projects. And then during the year, I as a civvy. Uh, well, I, I was, you know, you you do, you know, yeah. I I'd, I'd, <laughs> I had a background, I had some background in machinists, uh, you know, with welding, with machinery, things like that. And field robotics is is really great for hardware guys. Oh hell yeah! Especially at that time, you know, always, but especially at that time. I spent a lot of time in the field robotics center as well. I, I was sort of technically a visiting researcher there for three years after I got my MRSD. Oh, nice. So nice. I spent a lot of late nights in their machine shop with, uh, with Chuck Whitaker, Red's brother. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so. And I'll tell you, for his, one of the great things, you know, a lot of things in, in my career have been the same things that have been great have been bad. Um, you know, one of the great things about, you know, that short time I worked with Red is he, he just dumps it on you. But in, an, in a very positive way, like, I mean, a, in a very hard way, but... Hey, this is go figure it out. I'm trusting you. If you don't do it fast enough, he'll give it to someone else. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah, I mean, there were, you know, in the six months I worked for him, we did all kinds of crazy things where he's just like, go figure it out. And when you're a kid, you know, you're 19, that's, that's really, really exciting. Oh, hell yeah. And it teaches you to know your limit, you know. I, was, I wasn't a software engineer, so I didn't, I didn't say I was going to be able to deliver software for him. You know? Yeah. Deliver hardware. You know, if it's in the shop, if it's, if it's analysis, I learned... You know, I learned parametric modeling, pro engineer, FEA. I didn't learn any of that undergrad. Oh, that's um, interesting. I, wor- I, learned, Pro-E. I learned all that working. Uh, yeah, working at Field Robotics. They're all SolidWorks these days, I think. And that. And okay. That, well, yeah. so, SolidWorks didn't exist. Oh, touche. It was 1996. All right. <laughs> so, yeah. You needed like a forty thousand dollar silicon graphics machine to run. Uh, <laughs> pr- Pro E with a with a, with with, with full blown analysis. You know, with the Mechanica, with with the. The FEA packages of the day. Was that doing, like, you see these renderings from that era where they kind of look like AutoCAD, like 2D line drawings? No, that, that was that was full. It was it was full 3D. It wasn't that That's two. Cool. It wasn't two and a half D. I know what you're talking about. No, yeah. it was the early. Um, it looks kind of kind of blocky if you see it today. But, it, yeah, it was it was full 3D. That's cool. Yeah. yeah so, pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah. So, anyway, I worked for, yeah, I worked for Red for a little while. Respect him. He's. Like work, everyone who's worked for him understands 
how he is and why he's like that. And yeah. Even with the small, you know, small interaction I had, he may not even remember me today, but I remember. He probably remembers you. He knows who I well, am. But I wasn't I, expecting him to remember sure. me. Sure. <laughs> but I mean, the point is, even for you know, he can have impact without it being memorable for him. Yeah, that, that makes, makes sense. sense. Um, yeah. Then I worked for Hagen for a little while. And what was then, he like to work with? Hagen was, um, Hagen was crazy, <laughs> crazy and crazy smart in a different way. Um, Hagen was. This is this is. I'll, I'll tell this story. Um, Hagen would have us come in the the old field robotics. You know, uh, what was it building C the yeah. high the high bay? And um, is that the one that's um, the planter robotics high bay or the field robotics no, center high field bay? Robotics. Noel Simon. Yeah, sort of underneath Noel yeah. Simon before they built the top of it. I didn't realize there was a time when that was the case. That's interesting. Yeah. So a, that was their first. That's that, why those old windows are there in the way they are. Yeah, those were old Bureau of Mines buildings. That uh-huh. whole Smith Hall up on up on Forbes. Yeah. And then those two buildings, Noel Simon, the kind of the foundations of, of Noel Simon. I guess it was at Noel Simon. Yeah. Yeah, they, they were two buildings that when you walked into the high bay, the FRC high bay, that was the top floor. Huh. And it went down. And Which is why that's floor one today. Yeah. And like floor two and three are above that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <coughs> anyway, you know, Hagen was great to work with. Ha- same way, give you a ton of responsibility, say, hey, I'm going to, I want you to try to figure out X, you know? And I'm like, I'm, I'm just a kid, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, a rising sophomore, going to be a junior or something, <laughs> you know, work. You. He's like, well, try it. He's like, you're cheap. You don't cost me a lot. If you come up with a great idea, it's great. And that was, that was really interesting. That was the nice thing working for Hagen. That's um, pretty wild because like, I, I know sometimes it's exhausting putting in the management overhead to mentor like a kid that's just learning. I don't want to say there was no management. It's, it wasn't that, but, but in terms of say, you know, loosely bounded guardrails, Go take a look at this. There was a, it, it was, uh, I don't even know if it matters what it was now, but it was, we were trying to convey and move material and inspect it with cameras. For, oh, that's for cool. Manufa- for, to automate some manufacturing. That's really cool. Um, pre-processing. And he just to go, I'm like, well, he's like, just come up with a plan. Buy some stuff, you know, build a, you know, build a, you got an idea? I'm like, I think, hey, would this work? You know, combination of, of air and conveyances and that. He's like, that sounds cool. Build it, you know? Spend a week. Spend you know at the time I thought it was I thought it was it was like someone giving you a blank checkbook. Say go you spend it, don't spend more than a thousand dollars. A thousand dollars. A ton of money when you're a kid, right? <laughs> and, and twenty you know over twenty five years ago. Yeah. Well, I remember. But the, you know the other thing Hagen that, that I remember about Hagen was, um, <laughs> in that high bay it, space was contended. Yeah. The old Humvees, the Humvees that were part of the original. Um, nav lab project yeah that's the, the military um, ones that was was that the uh the red one that was used for like no, the DARPA? That. okay okay Even interesting. Before, these were military humvees that the military provided these were reds progr- projects um i think they were reds projects someone will correct me um <laughs> <laughs> kevin I, dowling if you're listening <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um but we had so they, they were in there but there wasn't a lot of work by the this is like 1996 maybe 1997 so by this time there's not a lot of there was still work happening, but there wasn't as much. They were built. They weren't, they wasn't, there wasn't the beehive activity to fit them out. And they were taking up a lot of space. And we were working on stuff for Hagen, and we were next, kind of next to it. So Hagen would have us stay, come in a little later and say, hey, just, just after those guys leave, push the benches. Like, <laughs> don't push them too far. Just, push, just keep every day, a little bit. <laughs> Wait, little so you bit. guys were just taking territory? Just trying to, yeah, take a little extra <laughs> space. Like, they're not using it. If we take too much, they'll tell us. You know, so Hagen was... I learned to color outside of the lines. That's hilarious. Like that, you know, whenever, whenever the things I, I tend to get um, chided for as an adult um, in my career, uh, some of those behave, you know, you learn, you got to, you have to color outside the lines. Yeah. You know, you don't have, you don't have room to build something. The people next to you aren't using that space. Start using it. If there's a yeah, problem, hey, no, no big deal. Sorry. We'll move back. Yeah. Um, Our mistake. <laughs> ask for, yeah. I learned to ask for forgiveness, not permission. Yeah, that's smart. I always, I feel like I kind of vacillate and on I'm both down, sides. I'm downplaying all the technical, you know, all the great technical. Like I said, I learned 3D modeling. I learned, you know, pro engineer when it was new. I learned FEA. You know, I was taking a degree Finite in civil. element analysis. Yeah. I was taking a degree in civil engineering. And at the time, we weren't doing FEA. We were doing some sort of two, two and a half D huh. structural packages that, that we learned at the time. But... The, there were grad students who were doing some some ANSYS work and that sort of thing, but 
I yeah, I was lucky enough. Yeah, you know, through through the through this little bit, eighteen months of time as an undergrad. Yeah, working at, in field robotics, I got exposure to all these things that I didn't. I was I wouldn't have gotten as an undergrad. The field robotics center is awesome. Like I um I tend to be a little bit I don't want to say condescending, but I look at academics a little bit as like somewhat insular sometimes, and I I can get a little judgmental, but. Even, you know, with that cynical attitude, I've always thought the Field Robotic Center is doing impressive stuff. And, like, it's kind of, you know, like, they, they actually yeah. build robots that work, you know, which is impressive. In, 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 my, in my work now, especially, you know, with a big, you know, huge OEM of, of big machines, folks who went to Carnegie Mellon who understand the Field Robotic Center or NREC or, th- or that mentality, you know, hey, that doesn't count till it runs on the machine. <laughs> Amen and, to that. And, and, and we say that, you know. They're the only pe- there are people at Caterpillar today who learned that um, yeah. at RI and at FRC, really, you know, working on those programs and knowing that, you know, it doesn't work till it's on the machine and you own it. And if it doesn't work in the field, there's n- there's not a there's not a main, there's not a production department like you're not just coming up with a concept and kicking it to someone. It, you own it. Yeah. If it breaks. You there's a chance it, it's going to have yeah, well, there's a chance it's going to break. You're going to be part of the team that goes yeah, just by default. And if it's not supposed to break and it does, you're going be ready to go. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love like, even when I was in there, they had like multiple car jacks just on the floor. You know? Oh yeah. I, I think I, uh, did a lot of work on my car in the basement of the FRC, <laughs> like on B level. Um, I won't say it on the podcast, but I still have the garage code memorized to unlock that big bay door. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, and I think that sort of thing was, you know, everybody did that and it showed initiative in their minds, right? You weren't taking from the, you weren't getting over on anyone by using tools in their downtime to do something that otherwise, you know, that, that mechanical work you did on your car or your, your home project or whatever you did using those tools in the off hours when there was no impact or cost to the programs. Sure, yeah, it was like 2 a.m. Bet, and it bettered you. Absolutely, right? it did. And I think that was the other thing those guys kind of got, you know, kind of that coloring outside of the lines piece. Yeah, well, I did my battle bots in the Field Robotics Center for yeah. years. I mean, you know, I, I, I would run those on their machines and, you know, George Cantor and Shock would come, oh, you're working on the new battle bot. How's it going? You know? Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, Absolutely. That was really, or like sometimes, you know, you'd get like another student that would jump in and help you with your personal project, you know, because yeah, you know, it'd just be like, you know, three in the morning and you were both there and you're like, what are you working on? I'm working on this. Oh, you mind if I need that's, help with your welds? Like, what are you working on? That's right. interesting. Let me, how are you doing that? Oh, oh yeah. We're using this kind of radio. Uh, how are you doing this? Oh, we're using this type of alloy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so. Excuse me, sorry. All good. And even the like I said, people went through there. When I worked, we're jumping ahead, but when I worked at Ari Squared, um, same kind of attitude. You know, there there would be. I like those guys a lot. It, you know, in the I remember in the evening there was a fellow, his son was younger, his sh- his son was getting a little older. He had a Power Wheels. Yeah. And you got a lot of smart people at Ari Squared. Even this is 12, 13 years ago, but still, sure. I mean, they've always had really, really good people. Um, and he brought it in, and the and it was evenings. He said, he said, I want to soup it up. So between some, <laughs> some electrical guys, some mechanical guys, I made a little, a little sheet metal body for it. Cause it, oh, was, that's awesome. it wasn't like cool enough. Um, and that kind of thing, you know, I, 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 I was able to teach in the process of doing that. I taught someone some sheet metal skills that I had from my, my background, not part of my, you know, kind of the, my background growing up and the kind of work I did before college and outside of college. Nice. Um, so yeah, like having an environment where that's encouraged Within reason, right? yeah, yeah, you don't want to like you never you never do it at the cust you know you never do it at the customer's expense, you never take from the company you never, but if you use that capacity to do those fun things and it builds camaraderie, it was great. And yeah, well, and I've kind of taken that too. Like you know, we've got like a small spice with like you know a three D printer and a laser cutter and a bunch of stuff. And I mean, I'll let students I work with just use that stuff. You know. Oh yeah. I mean, because you know, why not? You know, <laughs> enrich people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So what were you doing uh, earlier on where you got that background to know sheet metal <coughs> stuff? My, uh, my father's a mechanic. So he had his own business. He actually retired just this past year. So he retired at 78 years old. He, small business, 
you know, just him and, you know, sort of a three, three person business, him and usually two employees. Um, yeah, he worked from, he started, he got, he graduated high school, started working in 60, 1962 and he gr- retired in 2022. Um, aside from his two years he did in the service when he got drafted. So he did a, oh, cool. he did a full 60, you know, full 60 years, more than, uh, Probably twi- twice what a lot of people do for their working career. That's wild. And my dad recently retired, too, at, like, I think the same age, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, anyway, I, you know, I kind of kind of grew up grew up around that, you know, the general. And, and I think growing up around cars and growing up around small businesses um, that do that kind of thing. Here you go. Cheers. Cheers, Lou. <laughs> there was always, there were always, and I think going back to what I said about about the field robotics center, about, you know, other places, there were always some, sometimes the side projects were more interesting. Yeah. So, you know, my, my father's business was general repair, uh, auto body for a long time too. He had some health problems. Oh, cool. he, had, he had to stop. Um, he started having some, some, some respiratory issues. So they, that. they had, to, well, I mean, you know what? It was caught early. They said, just stop. You know, my dad was great in terms of that generation of folks didn't take the best weren't known for being the the most proactive about their health yeah well i mean they you were hear about guys reactive. that have horrible hearing damage that like worked alongside cannons or like heavy equipment that right. just never wore ear protection yeah but yeah. he this is geez 30 years ago um you know he he had a started having trouble breathing he got scared went to the doctor they, yeah you've got you've got you know base base from all the, you know based the on all the, expo- inhaling, the exposure and he had smoked he's like yeah. he's like what do i do and the doctor said you, you quit smoking today and uh, if you got any work in the shop that's body work, you finish that. Don't do it again. And he said, "Okay." They didn't have respirators back then. He, they did. They yeah. did. Um, but you got it. Like even brake linings. Brake linings for years had asbestos in them. Oh, brutal! You know, you, you wore the, you wore the resp- you wore the respirator um, when you were painting. Yeah. You didn't wear it when you're sanding. I'm thinking like the 3M dual cartridge. Yeah, the, I can re- he, I, I yeah. can remember he had some early ones of those. Nice. Um, but you wore that when you painted. You didn't wear it when you sanded. Ah, uh, dude, sanding so is when the, you need it more. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you get to the powder. But you got the headache from the paint. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's like the, the apparent. Anyway, we're getting off topic. No, 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 no. The I idea get is it. that you know it's uh, supposed to be off topic. It's a podcast. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, you, you you tended to treat the apparent things as like you know the inhaling the dust didn't make you feel bad that night. Yeah, that makes a lot of you, sense. You know, whereas that or even um, welding galvanized. Melting galvanized metal is ter- and it gave you a terrible headache, so you didn't do it. Oh, that's interesting. Um, thankfully, it had a really bad immediate side effect. So the things so that like re- yeah, immediate feedback. Oh, I don't like that. Yeah, this is a bad idea. I'm not going to do that. Yeah, right. As opposed to someone saying, you know, 20 the years from now, <coughs> pussy. Right. Bl- blow your nose. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, that's that's a little that's, weird. That's that's pink. Well, that's the color of the <laughs> that's the color of the paint the the putty. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> So anyway, I, I work, you know, growing up, growing, growing up around there. And that's an interesting way to grow up. There's always something fun to do. Um, and there'd always be a side project. It had been my father, my, my grandfather actually started the business. Um, and he was a really interesting guy. Um, very, very interesting guy. What did he do? Like, what was his, what made him interesting? Um, a lot of things. Hard, hard to qualify in a sentence, I realize. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's sort of threefold. Very, very, very smart. Um, didn't go to call, you know, of, cool. was, was of that era where, he, you know, you went to co- he went to high school, uh, like his high school was technical school. He went, he went for, uh, machinery. That's awesome. To be a machinist. Like that was of that, you know, he, he was, I guess my grandfather would be almost 105 if he was alive today. <laughs> um, so he was, you know, he had worked as a machinist. He worked the early part of World War II at Dravot. Oh, cool. Built, you know, building ships. So he worked as a machinist and, and, a, and a welder building LSTs, the light landing ship tank. They're the things, if you, if you look online, the, not the landing craft they used in Normandy. Like that's a Higgins boat, right? That's a Higgins boat. Yeah. The LSTs were big. They were, they were called light landing ship tank because you put a tank in them. Oh. They were, they were the ones you see in the, in the Pacific where they pull up on the beach and they open and the tanks drive out. Yeah. Okay. That's right. cool. Um, so he had kind of had that, in, that really interesting background. Um, and then he was in, he got, he got drafted, um, served in the war. When he got drafted after he was already building light landing ship tanks. Yeah. <laughs> they, That's they, wild. There were a lot. Yeah. So we need you off the line and in the, in the lines. <laughs> they had enough. Yeah. They, they were going to, this is, this is really off topic, but I found this out talking right. very late in life that he, um, He's a, like I said, he's a very interesting guy, but he's a very pragmatic guy. 
So everybody, he wasn't someone who volunteered for the service. Wasn't someone, you know, when he was called, he went. Um, but he was, yeah, he was working for Dravot. He was working in the war industry. And he was building the ships they were going to use to invade Japan. Yeah. That's what those ships were for. And there must be, it must have been a ton of surplus after the war. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he tells stories. Since he, got, since he got drafted late, he was in the occupation. He tells stories about just the amount of material that they <laughs> sank. Wait, why? Just because they had too much of it and who gives a fuck? Or? No, I think, it, well, this may not, it's funny. I work for Caterpillar now, so this is, this is nothing to do with my day job. This is what he, he said at the time. Sure. But the apocryphal kind of story was um, like the, the tractors that they used to pull the howitzers were essentially the same tractors, you know, Caterpillar made them for the war effort. They were very similar to the regular tractors that Caterpillar would sell, crawl, you know, crawling, you know, steel tracked tractors they'd sell. And they might have had the equivalent of two, two to three years worth of Caterpillar's output in peacetime. Of surplus. <laughs> so you would have killed. And that's just one example. You know, same thing with GM. The same thing, you know. You had so so if you break one, you don't fix it. You just get the next one. No, no. If they'd have brought it and they'd sold it, you would have bankrupted some of these companies. These companies that just won the war for you. Ford, General Motors, Caterpillar, whoever. You had so much surplus equipment. If... If you sold it used and they repurposed all of it. Oh, I Because you're cannibalizing their, yeah, their sales. Right. You're right. Got it. Okay. So, um, and that may not be true. There's history. People tell me I'm, I'm, I'm full of shit. I don't know. That's what my grandfather had, had said. But yeah. he said he remembers. That I that believe was, that. That was one of the things they would do. I and mean, they would just, they would sink this. The same thing with ammunition. Ammunition more because they didn't need it. Yeah. Well, they still do that. Like I have a or friend airplanes. that was in the Navy and, or sorry, in the Navy in the eighties. And he was telling me they just threw crates of like, oh yeah, they depleted still, uranium rounds off the side of the boat because they had to use the ammunition up, which is insanely yeah. wasteful. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. That was something they said like something like, well, anyway, that's off topic. But anyway, what made him interesting, I think, were those life experiences. Sure. Very technical, very smart. Came back, um, and after the war here, there were a lot of uh, engineering and machinist, machinery companies that had sprouted up, especially during the war to support that. And much like now, like when you had the gas and oil boom and you had all these companies that sprouted up to do that, and once the price is stabilized... Only the ones who were good at it survived, right? So there were a lot of secondary and tertiary machine shops or suppliers for gas and oil where when, when the prices were outrageous and people would pay whatever, you could build a business around that. But that wasn't long-term sustainable. So it was the same way. He came back, and there wasn't a lot of work uh, for a welder and a machinist in, like, 1947 when he came back. Yeah. Um, so he ended up working on was cars. Was that just because of the insane surplus that was created or probably a few things? Yeah, there, there, were, there were just a – I mean, you build a workforce. You trained so many people in those trades oh, uh, to build was even a labor equipment. surplus because you just did a labor yeah, surplus. Yeah, in peacetime, yeah. you wouldn't need that crazy production yeah, you, machine. Yeah, and people yeah. thought there was going to be a, a depression after the war. There'd be so much of a labor surplus. That ended up not being true because the rest of the world was in ruins. So there, was, there were markets for American goods. You had to build goods. stuff for them. Yes, yeah, but it's the, even though there was a cert, anyway, the the labor market had kind of changed. Yeah, and when he came home, he uh, the job he could find, he went to work for a uh, a Plymouth dealer. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so he worked and worked as a me- as a uh, mechanic, la body work, learned that kind of thing. Ended up, you know, kind of moving up to the point of running the being this. I guess you'd call it the service writer. You know, ran the repair division of a small Plymouth dealer, and then uh, 1952 he started his own business. Oh, cool. So that was that was kind of the the real deep backstory. Yeah, that, uh, I, I'm enjoying this. Like, I really am interested in that era of history. My oh, granddad yeah. dropped out of medical school to become a medic in the Army Air Force. Um, and so I, I I'm really proud of the fact that he did that. Like, oh I, yeah, you know, I mean, I didn't do anything, so I shouldn't be proud of it because proud should well, pride should be reserved for your own accomplishments. But you be proud of other people. Right? Yeah, I, I guess that's true. It's, yeah, you know, one of my relatives, but like. <laughs> I don't know. That that point in history is so interesting because I feel like everybody did what they had to do to, you know, like it was total war. Oh, yeah, it was and a different so, time. Yeah, it was sure. a, it was a different time and a different, you know, different ethos. You had different tools. You know, you didn't have the robots we have today. Correct. Right? So you had to put everything you know, was manual. Everything was manual. Yeah. Everything was manual. I mean, the stuff that they, you know, the he he got into the war late. He didn't actually get overseas until like December of forty four. Yeah. Um. And like I said, he, he actually, he was there through the, he didn't have points. He got there so late. So <laughs> he stayed, he stayed until 
late 46 or he might not even gotten home until 47. That's interesting. So my, my dad met his father when he was almost four years old because he had been born before my grandfather went to the war. Oh, that makes sense. But he was like 18 months old. Yeah. And grandfather when it, when was it, deployed like while he was growing up. Yeah. 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 And I was talking to my dad about this the other day. We were at a, we were at a funeral and some of them, my family, I don't get to see like his older sister. And, uh, she actually, his, his, my aunt actually told me the story that when he, when my, my father met his, his father for the first time, he said, you know, I'm, I'm your dad. And, and I guess my dad looked at me and he's like, no, that's my dad. This is his picture. Because <laughs> 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 you're four, you know, you don't know. And it was, it was such a heart, kind of heartwarming story. <laughs> but again, it tells you about the era and the time. Yeah, for and sure. The people. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that was, you know, kind of my grandfather's background. So he ended up, he settled on. But it sounds uh, like they taught you this stuff, like when you were growing up. And so you got a decent amount of fabrication experience in your childhood. Yeah, yeah. So he, he, the other thing that was really interesting about my grandfather was like a lot of the guys who came back from the war got interested in racing. Oh, cool. So uh, in the 50s, stock car racing was big, even in this area. I did yeah. not know that. There was, a, there was a NASCAR track in Heidelberg. Wait, that's crazy. Yeah. In Heidelberg, like Richard Petty's father won. I mean, that won the first race there in like 1949 nice. or something. Uh, yeah, that was there until the early. I want to say until the early 70s, but into the 60s, it was still on that. Like the NASCAR, NASCAR still ran there. That's cool. Uh, it's where Raceway. That's why they call Raceway Plaza. If you know the South Hills. Yeah. Where where there's a, a shopping huh. center called Raceway Plaza. I did not know that. Yeah. Okay, so that actually there was a ra- raceway there. There was a raceway there, and that's how they called it that. Okay. Yeah. So I think that was the other thing that got that was that. There were really, really innovative things you could do at that time. And he started doing really creative things. Like what? Um, he would get thrown out a lot for breaking the rules. <laughs> so he was trying Not to the, find the line. Find, and then find the line. Yeah. So the, there was no. Sometimes you jump over it when you're doing it that way. Yeah. Like there was no rule against. And if you understand how an, how, how an engine works, and there's going to be people telling me this isn't possible, but I, I've seen the pictures. Um, <laughs> he, had, he, had, he, he had a car with four pedals. What? And the fourth pedal. How the fuck do you drive that? Well, the fourth pedal, um, he can control the cam timing. The cam. Oh, that's interesting. You could turn the cam in the block. That's interesting. So you'd do stuff like that, like not not like out and out, just like kind of being an asshole and break the rules, but like, well, it doesn't say I can't have a fourth <laughs> pedal. It doesn't say I can't have an have an arm that that can change the cam timing. You know, because again, this is I'm into cars. I like cars. What's the advantage of being able to change the cam time in? Like, what can you do at some point? You have the power curve. So okay. when when you look at a look oh, at, that's interesting. Yeah. So if you look at a you look at can and this is one of those things in mechanical engineering that I respect, but I've never quite understood. Um, There's so much stuff about internal combustion engines that I respect but don't understand. <laughs> internal combustion engines are mechanical computers, right? I mean, you're yeah. timing, you're timing all of these crazy things. With nothing but mechanical levers, gears, and eccentrics, right? Correct. So the well, cam- now an ECU, but back then that didn't exist. Right. No, no, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. So the cam has lobes, right? Yeah. Lobes control when the valves open. Okay. And you know, you yeah, you know, today you you could get custom ground cams because it's all CNC. Yeah. But at the t- you know, 50 years ago, 70 years ago, you had like three options for a cam. It was like street track and, and half track. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and if what street you, track and half yeah, track. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it, it might be, it might, that might not be correct. Yeah. But it, it might, 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 or that might be an oversimplification. But yeah. Um, but it was know, based on the mechanical computers that existed in the milling machine or the lathes probably that made these cams. Well, it was based on the economies of scale. You know, yeah. you're gr- those are ground, cams are ground, not, mich- not milled. Oh, wow. Right. So now you're doing, you're doing offset centerless grinding operations. So, and you're doing it all by hand. So you only, just like you only want to have so many part numbers when you're doing everything by hand, you want to have so only, only so many profiles. Yeah. Right. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, imagine if your PID loop was controlled by a custom ground lobe oh, and Jesus. every time you wanted to change one, you had to go, you know, you had to grind, get another one machined. Yeah. Um, or machine it yourself. Right. So anyway, he came, so it's he, ground because it's smooth. hardened metal when it goes it's hardened on. and smoothness. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Makes the surface sense. finish you need. And the interaction of, you know, how, how you, how you, how you cut metal. You can't affects. machine and then polish, or I guess. N- well, cause you wouldn't get the tolerances. You the need work, because the, you, when are, you, you also get work hardening. Treat. Well, you yeah. get work hardening. Yeah. Those are prop they're, they're flame treated. So they're hardened surface hardened. 
yeah. and then they're ground to finish because otherwise you'd have to machine them soft, heat treat them, thermal will move, you know, so. Correct. Now it's going to be automotive guys who tell me I have no idea how cams are made. But, <laughs> um, but this I is mean, how cams were made. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, so anyway, there were all these things. Anyway, he, he came, he would do things like that, you know, like. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'd hear these stories, you know, growing up. Um, of these cool things. And then there were always projects. He, he had a, a farm, actually my father and I own it now, but a weekend place he bought, um, bought it after, you know, always kind of typical, like cliche world war two guy story is like, Hey, if I, if I ever survive this, going to get myself, I'm going to get, get myself a quiet place. Yeah. Right. And he did, um, a cool place. We went there growing up. Um, all my friends who went there, like they're just like this sort of idealized piece of your youth where it was just sort of, it's only an hour and a half away. I had one of those growing up. Everybody does, I think. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully. No electricity, no running water. Oh, that's interesting. We had those things. <laughs> yeah. No, this is a farmhouse that hadn't been yeah. lived in since 1936. That's awesome. He bought it in 1966. It had been abandoned oh, wow. for 30 years. Um, on like oh, 50 cool. acres of ground. And it was that's just like... When we you went three. When you went there, there were no <laughs> rules. Or the rules were different. Yeah. Right? Yeah, for sure. And you realize now the reason that was was because the adults were drinking. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, like there were just things you didn't, you know, I grew up in the suburbs. So yeah. you go up there and there's, there's a tractor and there's, uh, there was a 1949 Ford pickup that he had cut up and shortened and turned into a truck he called Mr. Haney. Mr. Haney. Yeah. So he made like a custom front end for it. That's awesome. Um, he got Volkswagen headlights and he made eyelashes on them, painted a face. That's like it was hilarious. just like he did all this, all this cool stuff for the kid, you know. Yeah, that would be like a Burning Man art car these days. Yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, you those kind of projects, like yeah. building Mr. Haney, was one of these things I remember. Oh, you worked on that. Well, I was little. I watched. Yeah. I, you know, I was. I watched them do that, but there were That's always. Cool. Around the business. But I would imagine like welding came into play. Yeah. And oh, yeah. And you probably yeah. got to do like a weld at some point. Oh, yeah. I, lear- yeah. I learned to. I learned to. Uh, I learned to spot welding is easy. Just two, two electrodes. Yeah. Learned to do that when I was about seven. That's cool. Not in a useful way, in a fun way. I still yeah. got a little sculpture I made. That's cool. Um, learned to uh, stick weld after that, arc welding. Um, there was no MIG when I was little. It was all. Oh, that's interesting. Maybe there was. We couldn't afford it. It was a small shop. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, and then I learned how to gas weld, oxyacetylene, braze. Nice. Um, yeah, so you learn that stuff when you're when you're young, and you don't necessarily. The funny thing is, like I tell people about it, like, oh, what'd you do with it? I'm like, I don't really do anything with it. Like I didn't, I don't have artif- other than the the weird thing I made with a spot welder. But the, I credit my grandfather and my father, especially, um, the the patience to just take the time to teach you, let you experiment, let you learn how to do it. Yeah, and it didn't matter. I had other friends of mine who's fathers were maybe restoring a a, a, a 39 Ford yeah. or they were building something and it like it wasn't Mr. Haney they don't it wasn't Mr. Haney <laughs> um who didn't have brakes <laughs> <laughs> he didn't no <laughs> That's hilarious. um you had to you had to plan your drives so when you were coming down the hill you had to, you, you could only drive uphill when you're coming down you had to come across the hillside and you had to put, have it in reverse before you started down and you slipped the clutch to stop it. Are you fucking serious? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> My cousin Bill's going to hear this and be like, you're telling all the good, like, because he's older, he's 10 years older than me. He, he lived this a lot more than I did. Like, I saw it as like a, like as a six-year-old, like, oh, this is cool. But he was like 15. Like, yeah. he was the one, you know, he, <laughs> he was the one who did, I got to see the work because I was a little. Yeah. Um, He was the one who lived it. Like, yeah. Well, I still remember my lab from when I was seven, and I was. Oh yeah. I had a bunch of wall warts that I cut the leads off of, and I put on Radio Shack alligator leads, and I had them clipped to like uh, electrical tape wrapped around some poles, and so like those were my power supplies, and then I had um, it just stuff like I would make like little electrical things with alligator leads and light bulbs, simple circuits yep. mainly, um, and then. I built my first robot when I was 12, and then I started programming a TI-83 plus graphing calculator when I was 13. That was the oh, first language nice. I learned was TI Basic. And um, I, I wrote a program that made seating charts for my math teacher, and it would always seat me next to my best friend, but otherwise it was random. Yeah, there and you go. Then <laughs> a little thumb on the scale. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
And uh, I made a program that would do my math homework for me for geometry. Um, it would tell you the steps so you could do the show. My I showed my work part. Oh, I'd be wow. like, now write this, then now write that. Now write what year? So I'm trying. It to was rules based. Uh, it would have been the mid '90s. So. I'm younger, so this would have been like when yeah. you were in FRC. I would have been like yeah. '95, '96. Okay. Yeah. So I was I was at Winchester Thurston down the street from you. Oh, very nice. Going yeah. to elementary <laughs> school. <laughs> Great school. Writing graphing calculator programs. No, yeah. I agree. Um, I recently mentored some students from there with the Girls of Steel. So mm. recently, maybe like, you know, seven years ago. But I think I just saw it today. Patty wrote is retiring. Oh, is she actually? I think I saw it when I was, we were, we were getting I gotta, ready for I got to call her up and tell her congratulations. I yeah. didn't realize that. You were setting everything up. I was just sitting here ignoring you on my phone. That was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was checking my feed, I think. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. No, I like Patty. I, I yeah. just uh, was hanging out with her like last month. Um, oh, Nice. Yeah, well, I mean, I volunteered for that woman for quite a while, <laughs> so um, it's a good place to hang out, the Girls of Steel. Molly Urbina was one of my students. She's now working for my oh, advisor, good. Brian Beyer, at Hellbender. Oh, very nice. Um, she got uh, laid off by my other advisor, Kristen Stanton, at Deep Local, <laughs> so it was kind of a hilarious little motion there. Yeah. Molly's great, though. Molly, I, I love you. You're awesome. You're, you're an excellent engineer, and it's great to see you grow up. Um, well, yeah. it's, it's good. It's good for people. It sucks when you get laid off right? for sure. But I mean, part of that, I mean, there's a, it's a good growing experience cause it's not all your fault. Not at all. Yeah. <clears throat> and it, it, it makes you, it, it forces you to sort of stand back up. You know, they always say fail, you know, you don't, you don't have to have like a bottom out failure. You get laid off. You're like, wow, I did not see that coming. <laughs> What do we do tomorrow? Right. <laughs> yep. And what you do the next day tells something about you. I started SKA after I got laid off from Joy Global. So. There you go. Uh, there you go. Should have worked for you, Cyrus. Yeah. That was before, though. I mean, that was a I while know. ago. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, a lo- lo- lot of back- lot of minutia in my backstory. No, I like this. This is this is fun for me. I'm, I'm sorry, listeners. This is going to be a long episode. and. You're going to have to deal with it. You can, cut all, you can cut all the boring stuff out. Uh, unsubscribe. Wow, well, we're, we're going to probably keep this one long for him, I think. But, um, but otherwise, anyway. our editing bill will be like $40 million. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, but, but with that, that interesting background, and then everything I did growing up, my father, my father raced, so my grandfather raced cars. My father raced cars. Um, the one kind of like very apocryphal story that, that 100% may not be true, but I'm told 100% it was was there was a racetrack, like I said, here at Heidelberg. And uh, it was a NASCAR track, so my, my grandfather was a member, you know, he had to have like a, he had to join NASCAR, which it wasn't like today, you know, like joining NASCAR at the time was like joining your, kind of like joining like the NRA. <laughs> like it wasn't yeah. hard. You just, you just show up. You paid, you had to show some, you had to have a, you know, like you had to have an entry that was qualifying. But it wasn't like today where they only raced every Sunday. I mean, they used to race like, six nights a week oh that's pretty cool you look at like richard petty winningish driver ever he won 200 races he run most he won most of them when the, when he was racing like four nights a week oh that's not when he was racing you know one sunday a month for or one sunday a week for you know 26 weeks i mean that makes sense. you rack them up with quantity yeah 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 and he used to win races by like five laps oh that's why it wasn't close yeah, yeah like it was <laughs> you know um but anyway uh, like I said, my grandfather had was had was in NASCAR. My father w- was my grandfather raced. He owned he owned a, he owned a couple cars. Had people. He never really liked to drive for whatever reason. He owned cars and he drove a little bit, but he he wasn't really he didn't he didn't like driving, and he'd have someone drive. And my dad was getting old. As my dad, you know, when he was sixteen, he got a, he built a race car, but you had to be eighteen to race NASCAR. Huh. Or actually, I take it back. You had to be twenty one. That's interesting. It's important for the story, but. He, uh, yeah, so my, you know, they're, they're in NASCAR. My father can't race NASCAR. So they're running, there were five, there were five other tracks here locally. Uh, and what was called the Pittsburgh PRA Pittsburgh racing association. Cool. Um, like it very close, like within driving distance, like Washington PA, South park, North park, Monroeville, like they weren't far. Um, but you had to be 21 to run them. So then there were outlaw tracks. So like, there oh, were, that's cool. Yeah. So they, they were outlaw, just that they were different. I mean, it wasn't that crazy. Yeah. Although you see the pictures, it was crazy. It was like, you know, I think, I think the, the unit, I think the safety regulation was 
like a helmet that went to here, a lap belt and a pack of cigarettes under your, you know, roll up your sleeve, <laughs> like, like you're doing an episode or doing a, you know, rendition of Grease. Nice. Um, so anyway, they're running. My, my father can't race NASCAR. They're running an outlaw track and they feel oh, Richard Petty's coming to town. Richard Petty's 18. Oh, NASCAR rules were you had to be 21. My dad's 17. So they, my grandfather said, we're going to the track. My dad, we can't race. He's like, if Petty can race, you can race. He's not 21. You're not 21. So they go out there and, um, and again, someone who was there, someone who's old, going to be in their 70s or 80s, is going to tell me I'm wrong. But <laughs> the way it was explained to me was um, they put a stop to the racing. We were going to rate. We can't. Well, neither can he. So what's, he's Richard Petty. Oh, that's interesting. He's a wonder kid. Like, it'd be like showing up and be like, Sidney Crosby can't play tonight. You're full of shit. What yeah. You? Yeah, he's, he's <laughs> of course, Sidney Crosby. Well, then my, kid, my kid's racing. we got the car. Everything's legal. Uh-huh. And uh, they made the guy who... Ed Witzberger was the name of the guy. He ran the Pittsburgh Racing Association. They had to like call the guy from NASCAR, like Bill Franz. They had, they had to like change the rules yeah. and have like a telegram sent. And they changed the rules. We only had to be eighteen because Richard Petty was eighteen. My dad was seventeen. Oh, he still didn't get to race. No, but like held up the race yeah. for an hour, supposedly. Yeah. Um. So anyway, Brutal. I think you know, a combination of when you do all that kind of interesting things, like I said, you're, you're raised and you're around people who were able to really solve really interesting mechanical problems, kind of machinery builders, yeah. problem solvers, um, and kind of obstinate pricks when they need to be. Yeah. It, it sets you up for a good career in robotics in Pittsburgh. Absolutely. Maybe. No, I mean, I, I feel like I've learned so much. And the education at Carnegie Mellon didn't help. Didn't hurt either. Yeah. I'll, I'll put that out there. John Dolan always encouraged me to work on cars, <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah. yeah. No, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, you know, you can't forget your roots or where you came from or, you know, the being able to actually make something differentiates you from an engineer that doesn't know how to actually make something. Every machinist hates the recently graduated engineer that tells yeah. them how to do their job but doesn't understand how machining works, right? Like, yeah. you know, you're like, hey, make me a part where... Design for manufacture is kind of a thing. Correct. And the only way you learn that is by trying to make things. Right. And working with good people. Yeah, that's true. Like, so I, you know, that was my backstory. I went to, you know, again, Carnegie Mellon, great school. I agree. I, uh, you know, I like to, I'm, I'm sort of like the guy, uh, if there was the equivalent of the joke about what do you call the guy who graduated last in his class from medical school? A doctor. Um, I'm the equivalent at Carnegie Mellon, right? I did not hit it out of the park. I mean, you're pretty we'll brilliant, though. Like, well, I mean, I'm practical. I'm I, I kind of slacked off when I was at Pitt. Like, I, I actually, I would, get, I would get a really good Jeep. I was like valedictorian all through high school, and like all the things below that don't even count. And then, like, when I got to Case Western um, in Cleveland, good school. Great thanks, school. almost went there. Yeah, I, I, I would break curves. Like, I, I'd scored top of the class in like you know 200 person calculus classes at Case Western, and nice. I, I was like the first guy that my mentor ever hired as an undergrad. And I got hired as a freshman to be a research programmer. Wow. And I, I was, I was good, but, um, you know, at a certain point I was just like, this, this is for nerds. Like, I don't really want to do this anymore. Like, I don't know. I was just, I was, I was kind of running myself into the ground and I applied to Arizona state. I would have applied to more party schools, but my parents <laughs> wouldn't have covered my education at that point. So I applied to Pitt and ASU, and I got into both, and I transferred to Pitt, and um, I just thought, like, this is a party now. Like, I'm not, I don't care about my grades anymore, and I flunked out my first semester. I, like, wrote a note that got me back into school. This I've never told on the podcast. There you go. And, um, you know, I I, I just kind of broke down and, you know, like, went back in, and I I did all the work again, and I I would do poorly in classes where I, I didn't believe or trust the professor i actually would do good in harder classes like um and i cross-registered in cmu classes as soon as oh, i nice. found i was allowed to do that you get one for free every semester as a pit or a ccac student remember that yeah yeah get your money's worth kids go to uh cross-register in a cmu course and so i did john dolan's mechatronic design and how he chose such general intro to robotics oh very cool yeah it was it was neat dolan was great we got four hundred dollars which was a lot of money <laughs> for a student it's tall. how are we going to spend four hundred dollars 
And then the MRSD, it was basically the same course, but we got four thousand dollars, you know, and it was very easy to spend both times. And well, you better do ten times better, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now it's funny for me. My undergrad, there were things that were there were definitely courses I took where I'm like. Yeah. I'm not like I love Mike Rowe, and he's correct about a lot of things. But there is when you when you're going to school, you know, I went to Carnegie Mellon, so very technical. Those couple of liberal arts things that they made you take were good, right? The 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 professional and technical writing course helped me. I use that more today than I use physics too. Oh, that's interesting. Right. Generally speaking, your assist, systems engineering, robotics engineering, communications is key. It's key. Yeah. yeah, and teaching teaching young younger engineers like that that idea that if you figure out like you figuring it out yeah was the hard part for you, but it doesn't count until you can actually f- describe what you figured out because then yeah. you, it just goes back to the whole the, the tree in the woods thing. Yeah, like if a tree falls in the woods and no yeah. one hears it, did it really fall? Or? Right. If you figured it out and yeah. nobody knows, does it matter? Like, does it did it happen? happened yeah. for you but you know so Carnegie Mellon you know the technical courses were very hard but doable and and you learn for me as an undergrad I learned there were certain things where I just I kind of hit my I hit my hit my limit like there were certain statistics like a second second order statistics were was hard for me I just yeah. you know there, there, you started started taking these courses where they say well you see this and naturally you know this I'm like I don't but do I, you I don't know that <laughs> yeah how did, how did you well you just and it was I'm like okay. I'm, I'm it's condescending I, sometimes. I don't think it was. I think it was oh, liter- I think it was literally because I like my sister has a master's in operations research. Yeah. Uh, my brother-in-law has a PhD in um, industrial engineering. He actually speaks at Cooperstown every year. He's oh, an interesting, cool. interesting guy, statistics guy, operations research guy. That's really, really successful. interesting. Professor at Hofstra. Cool. Ran their engineering department for a f- for a number of years. Um, loves baseball. Nice. Loves baseball. And everything is a place for that. What? Cooperstown. Well, so because he because he has this background and he has this kind of the gravitas of, of what he's been doing. Yeah. Um like all of his publishing is all about statistical analysis of baseball. Oh, nice. <laughs> and and economics around Has baseball. he just made a killing on sports betting, I would imagine? No, no, yeah. not that side of it. Like historical yeah. things. Okay, cool. Yeah, like the 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 app he, it's 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 great i've met students of his over the years like I, I took my family to disney and my sister was like oh you know i i texted so and so i'm like who's that I'm like oh she was one of rich's students and you guys should meet up with her she's going to meet meet with you and she was like one of the people who one of the engineers who devised the fast pass system huh because fast pass is not about making you happy it's about making sure that the right number of people are in the right place at the right time so that that organism that is Disney World works, <laughs> right? Because if everyone if everyone goes to it's a small world at the same fucking time, no one's happy. <laughs> You're not happy. Your wife's not happy. Your kids not is aren't happy, and whoever whoever's running Disney today isn't happy. Yeah, like it's it's weird. People think it's about control. With no, it's it's about me. Like everybody happy. Yeah. Um, and it's 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 statistics. Right, it's, that makes it's a lot of deep sense. statistics, and I realized I'm like I don't I don't grok this. Yeah, like I can't look at I'm a not situ- good at stats. Either. I can't look at a situation and be like ah, like I'm looking at all your tools here and it's like ah, all those cables clearly are described by the chi square distribution. <laughs> <laughs> like I can't do that. You know, yeah. maybe they are. Um, so I mean, they're anyway. probably not. Maybe they are. They're probably not. But yeah. the point is made. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. No, all that stuff confuses the hell out of me. I think I had like a really bad stats professor when I was an undergrad mm. and she just made it very boring. Like it was all like lookup tables and she seemed like she was barely awake and didn't want to be there. And I think it just, just turned me off forever. It's okay. like biting into a turd that you think is a chocolate bar when you're nine and you never want to eat a chocolate bar again. Right. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like having bad, I, I, you know, having a nice, nice glass of whiskey. Yeah. I had bad whiskey when I was like 16. And I thought I didn't like whiskey for years. No. Right. And I was like, oh, no, I just, I just didn't like that whiskey. Like, yeah, the, 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 my, my neighbor's, my neighbor's girlfriend stole like a bottle of really bad whiskey from her <laughs> parents' liquor cabinet. You don't realize. As you do in those days. Well, yeah. yeah. 
You know? No, I mean, we did that too. Yeah. yeah. That's tame. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway. I, stole the, I stole the vodka from my bris. Oh, like, wow. Yeah. I, I, my parents told me that after I stole it. They, like, made fun of me. I was like, ah, I got the Smirnoff vodka. They're like, that was from your bris. We don't drink vodka. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, like, huh. I know you said we can curse, but there's a, there's a line there we won't, we won't take. Fair enough. So anyway, we kind of my like I said, very very unfortunately deep on my backstory, but it teaches you know. Like no, I, I like it. I learned a lot of. Please, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I've I've told people I had a conversation today with uh, a peer, and so much of what you do, it's it's straight. You know, you kind of have this journey. You have this journey when you're a child. You go from being like coddled and you go through school and more and more of what you do is influenced by your upbringing, but isn't, but you have to do the thing yourself. Well, you have to do the thing yourself and you, and the, the metric is judged by others. Oh, right? that's interesting. Right. You nurture your children. You teach, you, you empower your kids to learn. Yeah. But you don't teach them. Yeah. Like I'm not teaching my, my kids are still little. I started late. So, yeah. you know, I'm not teaching my kids. Uh, math. I'm working with them. I'm empowering them. I'm giving them like interesting play things to do where they learn. You know, my five year old son says, I'm like, when are we going to go? I'm like, I'm like, we're going to leave in 20 minutes. And it's something he really wants to do. So he's like, that's so long. <laughs> 20 minutes is so long. I'm like, it's, it's, it's just, you just count to 60, 20 times, buddy. Yeah. It's like, really? Yeah. <laughs> And, like you know, I'm not teaching, you know, I'm not taking <laughs> credit for his math teacher, but you just try to, you try to, you try to, to build them that way. Um, and I think college, you know, you kind of, you get through school and like you said, you get to a point where you're really, high school is probably easy for you. Like I, sure, I can yeah. phone this in. Then you go to college, like, fuck. I can't phone this in anymore. This Grad sucks. school was where I really got this hit with sucks. that. I was like, I can't. Like, yeah, this you is, gotta, like, yeah, I everybody's gotta as smart as me or smarter. So it's sort of, sort of cyclical. Yeah. And I learned a lot. Like I said, there were things I learned at, at the great things I learned at Carnegie Mellon. And it taught, it, I mean, it really taught me to, it taught me to assess my, what, what, what am I good at? What am I bad at? And what should I commit to? Right. Cause every year, every semester, you gotta be like, okay, what am I gonna take in? And, you know, when you're, when I remember when I'm, oh, I'm taking everything. And then as you got older, it's like, okay, well, some semester, I'm like, that sucked. I had a tough, uh, I don't want to, uh, that sucked. I don't want to yeah. do that again. Got molded. All right. All right, okay, I can do this, and I can, I can succeed if I take an average, you know, not an, a sub-average, but an average course load. But if I take an extra one, I'm going to die. And, and so Carnegie Mellon really taught me that, that sort of self-metering. I don't know if they do that anymore. And again, maybe I think they still do. They'll they'll dump things on you. I don't think they brag about the attrition. Do they not brag about it anymore? Did they brag about it then? Yeah, I, in my in, in my maybe maybe I'm just a little damaged. Yeah, I you know, 1993, I go to Carnegie Mellon, made very clear that that one out of the you know, one out of the five people around you weren't going to be here. Holy shit! Well. I mean, to be um, honest, like there were times in grad and that was school. true. It was they, they weren't they weren't like threatening something that wasn't true. That was that was just how it's going to be. It was just the reality. Yeah, well, there were there were high exit requirements when I was there too. Like it was, it was fucking challenging. I mean, there were times when like you know I, I wanted to kill myself. Like it it was very difficult. Um, and I mean, I I had somebody in my team for my grad school projects that. We got along right away, and then we drifted apart, and so we kind of hated each other for the end of it. And you know, every time he would talk, I would open up a flask in my <laughs> lapel pocket and start drinking, and I would put it back in when he stopped talking. Yeah. And you know, it was it was. I think grad work was very different. You you were under in a very different cauldron as a grad student. Well, we still got boiled over in that cauldron. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, they they were trying to get us to quit. I mean, a little bit. Like, they, they wanted their stats I th to be good. I think there was more of that as a grad student. I think as an undergrad, it was more about, like, this is the bar. Yeah. Sorry. And you know what? In hindsight, I can say now, honestly, like, I thought at the time, you know, you're a kid. Again, you're 19, 20. I was, I was, I just turned 18. I was kind of young. I, I turned 18 
the day after I went to college. Oh, cool. Right. So like, I thought this was, in, this was, oh, this is unbearable. How can you do this? This is, in, you know. if I had the time today that I just wasted, cause I thought I was entitled to waste it <laughs> as an 18 year old kid. <laughs> I could, I could, I could do it twice, and but you, you, you get that with age. Yeah, for sure. Right, and I think that's the difference. Like grad work at Carnegie Mellon, I think, I don't think still not easy. Yeah, I don't think with twenty, with 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 however many years, fifteen, twenty years of, fifteen years of looking back or ten years, that you could say like, oh, I could do that in my spare time. But I, I, I could, I could do Carnegie Mellon undergrad in my spare time today. It pushed me to the edge of sanity. Like it was, it was challenging to do. Um, I mean, this is, I guess, me being a little bit vulnerable, but it was incredibly challenging to, to do that yeah. program. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Very, like I said, that, that's, a, that's a very different program. Yeah. Like I said, undergrad is kind of like going to summer camp. Well, and they, in they tried to cram, like, at the time I did it, the MRSD was a one-year program, so it was two semesters. And, like, it's not even a summer? Well, you, got, you did your internship in the summer. It was oh. Hoggins program. Okay. And since then, it's become a three semester program, and since then, it's become a four semester program. So they've kind of extended it so out. So no thesis, but still an internship. You had a project. Thesis? So your 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 um, thesis equivalent was like you you had project semester. So you would ah, do I like see. you would work on a mechatronic and robotic project, and then you would work a little more in your mechatronic or robotic project. Ah, I see. Yeah, and it, it was interesting because. It was it was the most like minded group of people I've ever been like. It attracted entrepreneurial roboticists, which you know there's not that many of us in the world, and I mean it was competitive, it was camaraderie, like it was if that's a word, it was. Yeah. You I know. mean, ha- I mean I, and again, I haven't talked to Hogan in years. Again, he may he he'll, 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 I think he'll, he's doing like. He'll remember me, yeah. but I mean, not, not like I, I didn't do a lot of great things. It's not like we, I, I like solved some major problem for him. Like he's going to celebrate me. But I mean, one of the things I remember about Hogg and I used to say, and you go back to your, maybe this is racist. He's German in all the best ways. <laughs> right. No. And I mean that yeah. like they're, you know, methodical. Yeah. Driven. Absolutely. Preci- agree. Precise. On all those things. I agree. He is like yeah. that. And those are also very German traits. I would yeah. love, I would, you know, he's the kind of guy, if, you know, I don't, I'm not a hundred, I should know what he's doing. I don't, I don't know that he, I think he's doing, he's, he's piloting ships. I think at this point, last I checked, like he's, he's doing like some kind of ship piloting thing as a hobby since he oh, retired from MRSD. Yeah. He's the kind of guy, you know, if someone said he was starting a company tomorrow, I'd be like, I wonder if he's hired. Nice. He's a cool guy. Yeah. Like really. Yeah, I agree. And again, he. I don't think he cares what I think about him, but he doesn't care what anyone thinks about yeah. him. Like I, he, I, I respect that about him, and I, I like. Um, it happens. Yeah. Oh. Thanks. I like I like how entrepreneurial he is. Um, when I met him, he came into Hoggins or sorry, Howie's class about okay. general intro to robotics, and it was the end of class, and he said, um, you know. How many of you? Well, I'm, I won't do the accent this time. But he said, "How many of you are studying?" <laughs> and he goes, "Like computer science." And a bunch of people raise their hands. He's like, "How many of you are studying?" And I raised my hand because I was a computer science. Player. He goes, "How many of you are studying um, mechanical engineering?" A bunch of people raise their hands. And he goes, "How many of you are studying, um, you know, electrical engineering?" A bunch of people raise their hands. He's like, "How many of you are studying business?" And I was the only one that raised my hand because I had a double major in computer yeah, science yeah. business. And, um, you know, he was like, you know, my program is designed so that, you know, people will get, um, you know, like many of you will go on to be the, you know, world's expert in whatever you do, like the, like the, the foremost scientist in this field or that field or, you know, whatever. He's like, but what if you want to be an executive and you want to go and you want to run a business or you want to climb to the top of you know, like a pre-existing business or you want to do all this stuff. And he said, my program's designed for those people. And I got kind of excited. And he goes, see, the business major gets it. You know? Right, <laughs> right. So, like he was. He well, was you fun. learn, you learn that like what he hit on yeah. and what he probably was trying to drill into all of us years ago. Yeah. And what I've only learned coming, kind of being in part of a big enterprise 
is the power of influence, yeah. right? You have to be able to, in, you know, you can, you can go, you can come into a company. I, I you know, I start a company. I, Spencer, I'm hiring you. Hey, good news. Right. I trust you. You had a great interview. You're in charge of all these people. Everybody, Spencer's your guy. Whatever he says goes, and I walk out. You're fucked. <laughs> Unless you know how to influence people. Unless, and I don't, I don't mean like in a propagandist way. No, I'm thinking of that scene from Band of Brothers where like the one lieutenant's complaining because none of his guys will listen to him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Like you can't just expect them. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but seriously, like Hagen, yeah. like that idea of that he, that, it, that he was trying to drill into you was, you know, that idea of you have to have a balance. You know, you're never going to be respected technically. But with no technical chops. Sure. Right. And you're never going to get people aligned behind you if you just kick them in the nuts with, t- with, with data. Yeah, 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 that's correct. The data has, so at the end of the day, the data has to rule. You can't lie about the data just to get people going for very long, maybe a little bit. Yeah. Or be honest that you're lying about it. I've had great leader. I've had great people I worked with who were leaders who'd be like, "Hey, look, this is bullshit. You got to do it. We all know it's bullshit, and here's why we do it." That's interesting, right? And be honest about that. That's that's the thing I've learned. Um, I don't want to say you know I won't say it at, in a big enterprise. But, you know, just that be honest about the things that sort of suck. Hey, this sucks. This is how it is. I'm not going to try to convince you that this is right or correct. Um, but it's just it's, it's the it's the way things go. And it's not immoral. Like these are not immoral things, you know, things like. I don't know. I'm trying to think of a good example that's. Yeah, you know, when I when I worked when I worked, I did a lot of contract research and development for a lot of companies. Yeah, and we're like, hey, you know, like, hey, I got a great idea. If we buy this twenty five thousand um, dollar temperature chamber, we can qualify the components. We can shave schedule off. Like, well, the program doesn't have program only has a twenty five thousand dollar hardware budget. So why don't we build it? Well. But it's harder that way. It's like, do we need a temperature chamber? I'm like, yeah. I think we have to build it then. But it makes more sense to buy it. It's like, but we can't. The sponsor won't pay for it. Even though it's the same money. Like, it's the same money, a different bucket. For yeah. sure. You're paying people's salaries otherwise. It, it, it's like complete yeah. arbitrary, like not yeah. making out on anybody. You just be like, it's more like, efficient to buy the thing. It's more efficient. I'm like, I'm like, how much will it cost you to build it? I'm like, well, it cost about the same. Then we have to build it. Well, that sucks. But I agree. <laughs> when, you, when you get to that point where someone who's a leader, someone's be like, I agree, you're right. But if we're as long as we're being, you know, um, we're not being disingenuous to the sponsor. We're not doing something. We're not going to do it with man time and cost. 10 times as much because we don't care. We say literally, if it's if you're telling me it's honestly equal, whether we buy it or build it, we got to build it. And it sucks, and you're right. And then, then you're engaged, right? And the business side of it, you're like, okay, thank you for being honest. Thank you for not trying to convince me that I'm crazy, that it's a better idea to build it than buy it. But you showed me the business side of it. It's like, hey, because of the economics of the situation, and the rules that we've agreed to ahead of time, whatever, yeah, whatever, yeah. whatever the sponsor has said, whatever the, whatever the, whatever the terms and conditions are, it forces you to see the business side of it. And like you said, when Hogan said, "Who's a business guy?" You are. I was the only one in the room. Sure, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it it makes you understand. Like, okay, thank you, thank you for taking the time to explain it to me. I was the only one that signed up for the MRSD in that room. <laughs> really? Yeah. Nobody else in that room made it into my master's class. What year was that? Uh, 2012, I think when I signed okay. up. So I was, was that pretty, that was pretty early then, right? Well, I, I would have gone in 20, th- 
2013 in the fall is when I started. When did that program start? Because probably like 2011. 2010? Okay, 2010, 2011. 2011. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was it was like the the second year I think had just happened or was I happening. See. I see. Yeah, and my friend Jimmy from the robotics club was in that class, so I kind of learned about it from him. No, it was a good. I mean, if I were younger at the time, I always say it was the kind of thing that I would have been interested in. Um, it's a good program. I mean, Hagen oh, yeah. really engineered it well. Yeah, yeah. I kind of got to a point in my education. You go back; it's funny. We we're talking. I started my, I started actually took it. I actually started Craigie Mellon as an architect. I want to be an architect. And I got about a year into it, went through my, my like second critique. You know what a critique is? I'm imagining it's where somebody just kicks your hopes and dreams in the nuts. Like, I don't know. Yeah, it is. But I mean, <laughs> in the, so Carnegie Mellon does architecture in a strength. And again, someone will say I'm doing, I'm saying it wrong. My recollection is um, Carnegie Mellon is one of the few places I went to school to be an architect. I, I, I was either going to go to Case Western, Carnegie Mellon, Columbia, or Penn State. Oh, interesting. Didn't get into Columbia. Fair cop, right? Probably wasn't cut for it. Yeah. Um, got into Case, got into Penn State, then an architectural engineering program. Got, you know, got conditionally into Carnegie Mellon. Conditionally? Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> I technically got in as a science student, but I was allowed to... S- to sit for architecture. Huh. Um, I was like, cool. right. I was sort of on the cusp and I guess someone maybe said, no, nah, we'll give the kid a kid, give the kid a chance. Um, so, but I, what I didn't you're realize the is that ended up in robotics. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll come back to that. There, there's something, there's something I learned in architecture that, it, <laughs> that, that I've learned most recently <laughs> is important depending on where you want to land in like you said in business and do you want to run the place or do you want to do the work um but anyway i didn't realize that carnegie mellon was the only place that gave a bfa in architecture most places give a bs oh that's interesting in architecture architecture carnegie mellon five-year program was 30 years ago if i'm wrong um i think it's still a bfa as far as i know and i think it's still five years as far as i know but people you know could correct us um but I got there, and it was very – in the, the College of Fine Arts at Carnegie Mellon is a conservatory program, whether you're studying drama, sculpture, painting, or architecture, whereas I thought architecture was a little different, right? Um, it was very art-focused. It was very heavy on – in a good way, it was very heavy on, um, I'll say, form, teaching you to draw – teaching you to visualize teaching you the you know teaching you sort of the practical pieces of art i'll say you know sort of practical art how do you you know i was really good at drawing i could draw buildings but i couldn't draw people and they wanted you to be able to do both good um but it was also very very uh it's very art focused in terms of concept over content i'll say or concept over function form over function yeah um and and critiques were very capricious you sat in front of three professors and most of the professors at that time maybe it's still the same they were working architects you know there were professors who taught you who were more more like professors yeah but most most all of them had still had skin in the game and they were working which i was feel good. like that's that's what i like about carnegie that was Mellon. good yeah, yeah. exactly but the critique could be very, very feel again for a kid feel very capricious. Like you start presenting, and then like these three pricks are arguing about amongst themselves, <laughs> and they're like, "Okay, yeah, C minus." They didn't really give you the grade, but, yeah. um, and it's just I wasn't cut. Yeah, <laughs> wasn't quite like that, you know. There wasn't, yeah, not the diving scores, um, but I wasn't cut for it at all. Um, and I, I'm like, okay, this isn't gonna work. And I'm, um, you know, my, my father, incredibly hardworking. My mother, incredibly hardworking, went back to school to make sure my sister and I could go to college. My sister, older than me, went to Allegheny College, small liberal arts school, you know, two hours north of here. At the time, in the mid-80s, 
one of the most expensive liberal arts schools in the United States. <laughs> That's interesting. Full stop. Yeah. Like I'm talking 35 years ago. This sound this is going to sound cheap today, but tuition might've been $16,000 a year. Yeah. $18,000 a year. That's more than I played, paid for pit when I went there. I mean, by, correct. by quite a bit. Yeah. yeah, correct. And then here I come, I go to Carnegie Mellon. I'm like, oh, fuck. My parents, are like, what the fuck are we going to do this? <laughs> um, so the last thing yeah, I wanted... That's the most expensivest? Well, I, I don't think Carnegie Mellon was the most expensive, but it was on the tail end. Like, my sister's five years older than me. So I start Carnegie Mellon, like... A year after they finished paying for that. Oh, brutal. <laughs> right? <laughs> so My grad school was not the, cheap. The la- yeah, oh, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. But the last thing I was going to do is tell my parents, I'm like, hey, guys, this ain't for me. I'm going to start over. So I had to find something. I'm like, I got to finish. If I change from a five-year major to a four-year major, I can't. I don't have five years of financial aid. I've got four years of financial aid. So I got I to I pick a degree that I can get out of here. By the end of 1997. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I ended up being a civil engineer. Cool. I had the most transferable credits. Yeah, it makes um, sense. Found really cool, cool people over there. A couple other sort of say expat, expats, expatriates. A good friend of mine who was a, also a sort of an architect who was like mm, the same for me. Yeah. She and I both ended up in. It's in funny civil you mention that, but I, I've actually met other people that started architecture that ended up in robotics, like. Kevin McPhail, if you know him, is... I know the name. I never met him. Him and I were interns at Deep Local at the same time in okay. 2014. And he is... He's great. He, he's a good dude. Um, I like him a lot. I think he he's at Meta last I checked, but he, he might okay. be somewhere else by now. I'm sorry, Kevin, if I'm misquoting what you do. But um, he was an architecture graduate, and um, he uh, was roboticist hardcore all the way. Like, he, robotics guy. There were a couple of architecture folks, a couple of art guys. I forget the fellow's name now, Colin. I don't know if it's still there. I haven't been to NREC in years. But when you walk in NREC in the lobby, there's like, there used to be a, 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 a piece of artwork, which was like a glass etching of a fellow walking with like a mechanical thing. Oh. He had, had like a had like a, a replicant of himself behind you. I think I remember that. Do you? I, it's probably gone now. Yeah. Because um, the think guy I've seen that. the guy was actually if you look close the guy's nude. Yeah. Which why would they get rid of that? It's just maybe you know these days you know I mean Enrex conservative as hell. Well but. yeah I mean art guys are always going to be nude. Yeah. They can't that's be. just what you do. But when anyway you're in art. that guy I forget I forget that fellow's name but when I when I worked for Red that you know for that you know nine months or whatever. He worked there as well, and he worked on some other things. I can't remember this kid's name. might have been Colin. But anyway, you ended up getting these really, really interesting art, art fellas, art folks, who were, had enough of a technical bent. And, man, if you got those, tech, those art, artistic folks who had a technical bent, they were phenomenal to work with. I agree. You know, um, in a certain phase of the program, right? Yeah. They're, they're not going to do your V&V. Correct. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, and you, and nor, nor, you know, and if you expect them to do your V and V, you're stupid. It goes back to that idea of how yeah. do you build, how do you manage teams and and yeah. and sort of influence people. But um, yeah, uh, I agree. That makes sense to me. Yeah. There was one guy in in Howie's class when I took it that I think he still works for CMU because I've. I visited campus recently a few times. And I think I saw him walking around. I don't remember his name. I feel like an asshole, but he, um, how he said something along the lines of like the artists make the best robots. And then this guy p- kind of proved that to be true by just coming up with creative, interesting ideas that would like win competition. Cause Howie's class was just a series of competitions. Yeah. It was like seven competitions and like every assignment was a competition and you were c- competed against the other students. And, um, yeah, that was, that was how the class they worked. Could, yeah. It, it's now, you know, I step back with my, you know, my current role, it's a little, it's broader focused, you know, so it's sort of end to end, you know, the buzzword is end to end concept to customer, whatever the bullshit phrase is. Sure. But it is true. You know, like a lot of cliches are true, are statistically provable, right? Yeah. Um, 
and it, yeah, some some of these some of these really really artistic folks that I've worked with over the years, they also but they played in the system, right? Someone Amy you know, Warhol started out making advertisements, right? He started out as a sort of an industrial artist. Yeah, he started doing like drawings uh, for Kaufmans. Yeah, and like Coca Cola and. Well, that came later, I think. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I like he he was that. he was literally his. So another you know weird kind of local thing ties back to my family a little bit, but we'll take credit for it. But um, if you go, you know where the Heinz lofts are. Um, I think so. Yes. Yeah, you know, the old Heinz plant. They got the the yeah, uh, yeah. the one of my buddies from the CMU Box Club is in there. Sure. Yeah. So you go down there. There's a there's a company. You gotta you know you got scrap. You know you're gonna scrap. You got you got an old robot. You're done with. You're going to scrap some 80-20, be like, hey, we're not going to throw it away. We'll take it to the scrap yard, get some money for it. We're a hall of scrap. We're a hall of scrap. We're a hall of. That's interesting. Andy Warhol's two brothers own, were scrap dealers in Pittsburgh. Dude, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, in, very interesting stories. You read up on it. So both, so two of his brothers, and there's, there's two scrap dealers in Pittsburgh who are the descendants of them. But yeah, there, there's there's like a really interesting book that I think one of his brothers wrote about how, for you know, you think Andy Warhol, avant garde, sort of unapproachable, like you're kind of like, well, he's he's you know, it'd be like you know, you or I walking up to like uh, Banksy, yeah, like you wouldn't walk up and just have a conversation with him. But his brothers wrote stories about they they were a very tight knit family, yeah, so like his brothers would take, would go on like vacation when his, when, when Andy was in New York, like, Oh, load the kids up. We're in the station wagon. Like picture Mike Brady driving up to Andy Warhol's factory. <laughs> and that's what read the book. There's some really interesting stories interesting. about that. Um, I forget how we got on that. You mentioned we were uh, talking about um, architecture, industrial artists. Oh yeah, you said yeah. yeah. Andy War- Andy Warhol was a practical artist. Yeah, and he's a good example of you know if you're going to hang a picture, hang it straight. For as conceptual as he was later in his career, he sort of cut his teeth and made his bones, um, doing it. Yeah, and there's a there's a I think there's a big piece of that too when you start trying to work with younger engineers you start trying to you know sort of not manage not like management not dale carnegie kind of bullshit managing people but influence like people dale carnegie? huh i said you don't like dale carnegie i do i mean you have yeah. to you have to influence people but yeah. the way you technically you know i don't think you're going to take dale carnegie's methods and apply them to a 22 year old kid oh that's who's working for you tomorrow yeah, yeah. right it's a different set of rules it is you and you're going to you're going to influence them by appreciating where they are. Yep. Understanding what they can do and encouraging them to go from where they think you and I talked I think we talked about this the Cascadia Capital thing or at the innovation one of these things when we did the the talk about about epic failures. I might have I think we I feel like we this talked about this. This was at the Robotics and Aviation Summit. Robotics and Aviation, yeah. yeah. It was like when you think you're done you may have just started. Right. It's like, Hey, I got it done. I'm like, I think this is the beginning. Yeah. Um, connect with them there. Right. And, and help them understand like the concept matters. The idea matters. We're at the execution, execution stage. If you can't execute, no one's going to care about and, those other milestones. Right. Like if it does if it, again, if it doesn't go on the machine, if it doesn't run on the machine, Nobody cares. Yeah. You got it. You know, helping, helping engineers understand that there's a barrier to where they have, they have to take ownership of, pro- you know, they have to, they got to be an asshole. You got to prove like, yeah, you got to F you. It works tooth and tooth and nail it works. to get it into existence. Yeah. yeah. It works. And I'm going to prove it to you as opposed to say, well, I know it works. I don't have to prove it to anybody. Now let me help you with that. We got to prove it to everybody. That's too academic. I'll, I'll help you. I'll help you. You know? If it really works, I'll help you prove it to everybody. Yeah. If I well, learned anything at a big enterprise, that's one of the one of the three big things I've learned. The way I've seen you work with younger engineers is admirable too. I mean, I, I uh, some of them would disagree. <laughs> uh, that's fair. But thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. 
I mean it. I mean, you know, I don't know. I, I, I have a huge appreciation for like mentoring and bringing up the next generation of, of what we do. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, because we're standing on the shoulders of people that did that for us, you know. And so oh, it's, yeah. That's important. And it's funny, one of the, coming to work, you know, I work for a huge, you know, huge enterprise now. And at the end of the day, projects are projects, deliverables are deliverables. And I have the same struggles today. I have a, you know, really, really smart, I won't say his name. I don't know if you'll see this, but a really, really smart young engineer on our team. And I love that I don't spend enough time with him. I love the time I spend with him. And... You know, the program, it's a constant struggle where it's like, you know what? If I just did it, it'd be faster. Or if I told him to just do just enough to get the project done, he'd learn a bad habit. Oh, I gotcha. Right? So be like, hey, we're going to do a full DFM spiral on something that may not need it. Right? Yeah. If he, as someone who's, you know, junior, very young mechanical engineer, doing sheet metal pattern development, you know, something very detailed and for what he's doing may not matter. Product will ship. If he used his, if he used what he knew today and ha- and sent those drawings out, stuff would get made. We'd make it work. Program would be on time. It's making that time to say, okay, let's do this correctly. I, I want to teach you about pattern development. I want to teach you about design for manufacture. I want to, I want to, and again, when I say teach you, I mean force you to learn. I'm not going to spoon feed you. Yeah. I say, what about this? What about that? Does that make sense? Um, so even in a huge enterprise where you think you, know, you go to work for Ford or GM or Caterpillar, well, we've all <laughs> this time and you got tons of people, 120,000 people, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you got a scrum. Yeah. You got a program. You got a deliverable. We need, sh- you know, we got people need shit yesterday. Correct. So finding the time to do that, um, finding the time, defending the time is easy. Uh, only carving it out when it, it's appropriate is hard. Um, and that's what I go back to my, my family. I learned that from my parents, my father, yeah. my grandfather. Right. You want to you be patient when you teach. I'm impatient. If you do something wrong the third time I told you not to do it, I have no patience for you and people have complained about it, but I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the patience of Job if you'll hear me out. Yeah. And if you ask me honest questions. Well, so one of my mentors said something to me when we started working together, like maybe eight years ago that I really liked. And it was, um, I don't like having to repeat myself, you know? And so I, I like that he. Told I accept me that, that today you have to repeat yourself at least once. I'll say it twice. Yeah. Times are changing, right? <laughs> at least for me, we're sort of different generations. He's I old think. school, like yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm sort of, I'm I'm very firmly in the middle of Generation X. Yeah. You're, I don't know, are you? This guy's like maybe like ten years before that, so he was. Um, he's still. Oh, he's, I mean, he started his career in like the early '80s, and so he's right on that boundary. Yeah, I was arguing with someone about this. These these sort of like boomer Gen X, like these like twenty year generations don't work. Yeah, right. Um, how do you mean? Like, because there's so much difference. I was oh, in like a young millennial versus an old millennial, or like, right. or like I'm I'm yeah. firmly in the middle of Gen X. How right. long were the boomers there for? So I mean, they I, say twenty years. That's forty six to silly. like sixty four. I thought they were the, just the people that were made when they got home from the war. But you're right. That's because, what I thought. No, no, yeah. they they categorize. If that were true, none of them were working. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or then someone said to my my father, "Okay, boomer." He was like, "I was born in forty three. I'm not a boomer," and he's technically right. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> He's the great uh, generation by like two years. <laughs> well, so. he's yeah, you know, yeah. he's something. Yeah. Um, but he would have been. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> he's like so. You know, like people get overlooked. Is like yeah. my dad was born in fifty two. Right. 
So he, he, I think he's he's kind of firmly a boomer, right? Like he could have gone. No, to my Woodstock. dad's my dad's like boomer as they get. He's the middle of the boomer band. Yeah, yeah, he, he yeah. He, yeah. Whereas like my dad, my dad didn't go to like did you go to Woodstock? He's like, no. My parents were so posh that they my mom had tickets to Woodstock and then decided not to go at the last minute. Yeah. And she'll tell me that. Like when I was going, she's like, I had tickets to Woodstock, but I decided to, I'm like, why are you telling me this story? Yeah. But it's like, not a good story. Whereas like <laughs> my, my parents are like, Oh, Woodstock, that was that was that was for the kids. <laughs> That's interesting. Like our like my parents are like the Greece generation, right? <laughs> they're like buddy <laughs> they're buddy Holly. They're not they're not you know, the Rolling Stones. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um anyway. And my parents like were into the Rolling Stones and then they just got to be super competitive professionals in the seventies. They're yeah, they're they're yeah. total. They're they're boomers and then turn into yuppies, right? Yeah. That was the whole As George Carlin said, from cocaine to Rogaine. You know? yeah. <laughs> so. I love George Carlin. Yeah, I do too. I grew up on him. He um it's interesting. We were talking before this how like I, I you asked me to do this and I've never really done something like this. So I intentionally didn't like I'd seen some of your stuff before. I'm like, I'm not gonna watch it. I don't know what your format is. Yeah, I appreciate that. Hopefully, hopefully you don't think it is a a dodge. No, not at all. I mean, I, I'm kind of you know, I, I like off the cuff. I think it's more interesting. Yeah, but it's funny, George Carlin. I always loved him. And I saw him live when I was 14 years old. Oh wow, where? Uh, in Ithaca, New York, where I was living at oh, the time. Cool. I, I lived there for one year. I saved up my allowance for weeks. And I got a ticket to see him. It was standing room. It was the cheapest ticket I could find. And it was like some theater. And he did the Life is Worth Losing tour. This would have been like, you know, 2004, I think. Oh, wow. Okay. And um, he was doing, uh, I won't repeat the names of the bits, but he had some good material. And um, there was um, someone I was attracted to from my high school at the time. And. (laughs) I was like 10 times more attracted to this person after I saw them at the George Carlin. I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. we both like George Carlin. Oh, my God. Yeah, <laughs> like so. That was neat. Um, and I, he's kind of a kid at heart, so I feel like he's he's very yeah. kid-friendly. And, and George you know, Carlin? Yeah, you don't think of him as being because he's obscene. But Aside like, from the language. No, he, yeah. He, but at the same time, he's got like a childish demeanor in mind, and he's Mr. Conductor. Um, he, he has, well, Thomas yeah, he's, that's true. That was, yeah. A, yeah. But he has a he has a very I was I was surprised to learn later that was it Mr. Rogers Neighborhood I no he's Mr. Con- yeah Thomas, Thomas on Thomas yeah. Thomas the Tank Engine yeah. yeah but I remember I you know later like his bits like all of his stuff feels very spontaneous and he is like as rehearsed as uh, he pioneered like an era of stand up right with that but it, was, but it was all like you're right it's like music. Yeah, it's musical. It's it's like him going up there and doing that would be like, you know, the Beatles going up and do, doing Sgt. Pepper's like. But it was that it's idea. Cadence, it's rhetoric. It's very precise. A hundred percent. Yeah. But he, he was the one that pioneered because like before him, people would build up, you know, the same rehearsed thing, but they would do the same bit for like 20 years. Oh, yeah. Carlin, with his HBO specials, pioneered the idea of. I'm going to do this for a, a new couple stuff of years. E- yeah, new stuff every year. And I'm going to have an entirely new set the next time I release mm-hmm. a special, which I, th- you know, it, it's kind of brilliant. I mean. Oh, yeah. And that's what everyone does now. Yeah. Well, I think the other thing that I, I, I saw some interviews with him. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Later in life. And, uh, you know, he, he clearly stated he was like, all I'm doing is rhetoric. This is, you know, the definition of rhetoric. Right, grotesque oversimplification, discussion, all those sorts of things, and even though you know, go back to what what works when you're trying to influence people. Sometimes those rhetor, sometimes the rhetorical things Repeating I learned yourself strategically. Yeah, sometimes the rhetorical things I learned from my grandfather, my father. You know, sometimes the rhetoric I learned from listening to George Carlin or Christopher Hitchens. Yeah, is useful. Nice. Right, I agree. Yeah. Now, I've learned a lot from Carlin. Like, I mean, I, I feel but like... don't be an asshole is the trick. Yeah, don't be an asshole. Well, and have you read his... Um, he has a autobiography that he wrote called uh, Last Words. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. Uh, I love that it's read by his brother Patrick Carlin post-mortem, so it kind of sounds like him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, 
I like the bit where he's like, it was it the Rand Corporation had like an event near his house and. You know, he says to his daughter, hey, look at all these assholes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's it's interesting that he had such contempt for the corporate world and, and now we work in it. <laughs> well, yeah. Coming so up. I had someone I work with now, really, really great. I hate I hate the word leader. Yeah. Um, but someone who inspires you. Sure. Right? Like I, I've worked for so many shitty managers fits. who when you call them up, like, dude, you're not doing your fucking job. So well, I'm a leader, not a manager. I'm like, if you say that, that means you're not. Like, yeah, don't, don't yeah, say that. You to shouldn't me. have to self-define. Um, that don't way. ever say that. Uh, it's like wearing the band, wearing the shirt of the band you're going to see. Yeah, <laughs> it's like don't be that guy. Exactly. Um, but then you know, other people I've worked for who, for you know, you learn. I learned a lot about rhetoric listening to reading Carlin, listening to Carlin, and all these other things. And rhetoric is very useful to convey a point. Yeah. Up to a point. And then I, I work for a fellow. I've worked with a fellow who's like, can I give you some straight talk? Can I tell you something? I'm like, yeah. He's like, everything you're saying is correct. I'm like, thank you. He's like, and you're an asshole. <laughs> I'm like, wow. I love that he says and rather than but. <laughs> no, it's and. Yeah. It's and specifically. Yeah. And he's, he's like, hey, someone, you know. Ten you're years not mutually ago, exclusive. Ten years ago, someone gave me the same input. Like being rhetorically correct doesn't matter sometimes get to the point where you're correct you convey the fact that you're correct then start to influence yeah well that's you know. still carnegie bullshit is no it's not I, oh I interesting i don't think so i don't think so I, I think it's it's tactical in terms of you know you go back to robotics you go back to a lot of a personalities and people are like it just has to work yeah. right um but at the end of the day is like data drives but you know, if you if your data is correct and everyone hates you, you're still fucked. Correct. 100%. Right? So I don't think that's Dale Carnegie. I think it's um I think it's that idea that being yeah. being rhetorically correct and actually getting getting people on board to you know, go in the direction you need it to go. Sometimes, you know, in engineering, robotics, anything, it's like, "Hey guys, the data says we're wrong. That sucks. What does that mean? It's like, you got to start over. That sucks. I know. So at that point, once everybody says, once everyone accepts it, stop beating them with it. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. Hey, let's, what do we plan? How do we do? What's, what's the impact? Let's do an impact analysis. It's like, oh, we're screwed. What? Nothing. Everybody's screwed. It's not like we're screwed and the sponsor isn't. This is found complexity. This is, we did everything we said we were going to do. We did the feasibility. We, we got the data. We thought the data was going to say A, it says B. Let's get everybody on board, right? And I think in robotics especially, that's, that's, where, that's where I give you credit for, for kind of putting your shingle out there and doing the things you're doing. Thank you. Put you it puts you, and it's where I've, I've failed as a younger engineer, when I tried to do, you know, on a smaller scale, some consulting, um, it really puts you in a vulnerable spot because sure. someone's going to give you work that says, Hey, based on a, B and C, I need you to do D. You're like, great. And then you find out C is not true. <laughs> <laughs> and then all, and it's very easy for a customer to be like, Oh, it's your problem. Whoa. You know, and how do you handle that? How do you deal with the data? How do you, yeah. you know, how do you have a data driven approach to found complexity to it's not, it's not creep scope. Everyone's oh, it's creep scope. No, no, no. Yeah. It's found complexity. Like this is, you know, we assumed a lot of know. it comes down to being selective with who you choose to do business with and sure. also, um, good communication. So just frequent comms and also like the fact that we've switched from a fixed, uh, model to a time and materials model. Like I'd say those three things are kind of critical to being able to be okay with that. As Even fixing from fixed model to a TNM model, you probably lost business. Sure. There's going to be there's people who are like, I don't want that. Plenty of companies that don't want to do business with a TNM company, but right. at the end of the and day, I mean. And even TNM, there's a middle ground. And sure. We found yeah. that talking, you know, there's, there's sort of a, there's sort of a disingenuous TNM model, <laughs> right? There's a big, I won't name companies, but like big consulting engineering companies that are just like, Hey, we'll try. And whatever happens, you're, you're paying the bill. 
and you know finding that middle ground it's hard yeah and i think you're doing it well thank you very much i appreciate that low (laughs) trying it's always a try it's always it's always hard right yeah yeah, well, I'm, seriously, that, that's like super kind words. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't sit down with you if I thought it was just the podcast and it wasn't the other stuff you're doing. I, I really so. appreciate that, man. Cool. So what other projects are you working on that you're excited about or have you worked on that are super just cool and interesting that, that you're particularly proud of? One of the, you know, I can't talk a lot about what I'm doing now. Sure. Unfortunately, there's a lot of interesting, a lot of really, really interesting off-road autonomy in general. I, I can say this. I, I think off-road autonomy is, I think Prague probably said some of these same things. A lot of people who are working in this. The great thing about off-road autonomy is it is a structured space. You can define, realistically define a problem set, not artificially, where you can bound a problem. You can solve a really, really hard problem cutting edge technology and monetize it right you don't have to stop have to uh, solve full stack l4 on road autonomy so off right now the thing that keeps me me keeps me interesting interested is that nature of off-road autonomy which obviously you know my day job that's what we're working on so very very interesting very exciting um hard you know, but you can, you can structure that problem so that there are monetizable solutions that make you money as a roboticist, makes the customer money, the guy buying the hardware. That's the goal. And that's really exciting. Um, going kind of deeper into my past, I worked for a small company here. This is going back, you know, over 15 years ago. Um, we were, this is two, uh, more than, like I said, 17 years ago, maybe 2005 time frame doing work small comp- local company doing manipulators um and i th- i'm pretty sure we may have sold the first production stack we sold 50 manipulators to a division of, of uh, northrop grumman called remote tech fielded them deployed them for the israeli uh police oh this is a cool project but it was really interesting this is like circa 2005 um it's you, you know you go back 20 years there weren't a lot of robotics companies. RE Squared had been founded. They were doing really, really interesting content. That was just when they were starting, though. It's got to be. I think RE Squared, you know, and people, again, Jorgen will correct me. I think it's. Two, Sorry, Jorgen. No, I think it's. Love you, I, buddy. I think it's 2001. Hopefully I'm not. Yeah. Um, hopefully I'm saying that correctly. So, you know, Jorgen was, you know, there were only a handful, and, and, and Jorgen and RE Squared were one of them. I remember at the time, people were like, what you, you know, what RE Squared's doing is incredible. Um, I worked for a small energy company, and we had some some manipulators we had used in in uh, nuclear space. Oh, cool! Do, DOE, hot cell, you know, harsh environment systems. Um, and by harsh, you mean getting hit with radiation? Radiation, yeah, yeah. Like, like very, very. The environment itself is limits your selection of materials and components. Yeah, and, makes sense. And that kind of thing. Um, so a kind of a very resource limited. You probably have to use like a tether to be able to get to the hot area from you know where you have your real compute housed. Yeah, they they, they were tethered, but yeah. even the materials you used in the in cell, in not in cells, but they talk about today, they can't get laid. <laughs> Hilarious. But, but in in hot <laughs> like the hot cells, like yeah. in the cell in, in the hot cell, right? Yeah. Um, very 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 constrained in not terms of in what cells materials you can. <laughs> <Just> um, <laughs> It's a different podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. But anyway, I worked for, like this little, you know, we had a small company. We it worked for a small company that had these manipulators, um, very power dense, very small, but heavy lift. Uh, they were hydraulic based and they could lift 150 pounds well, that's at, cool. at, at like four and a half feet. That's, that's pretty awesome. It was heavy. Yeah, it was yeah. very good. Um, got partnered up. Uh, division of Northrop Grumman was looking for something like that. We did a custom a one-off it was a rocky thing as it tends to be you know sometimes you think you're a company you know i got this these guys want something like this well it'll be close enough close enough well not always it was it was a very very i still see the the fellow i worked for i just i i just went to a i invite him every year to a he's retired now but a sporting clay shoot up at seven springs we still talk about the time we spent 
Like, uh, we thought it was going to be easy. <laughs> Man, we were wrong, but we did it. Um, so anyway, we delivered. Here it is, like I said, imagine 2005. Take the contract in 2003. By er- late 2003, by early 2005, we're delivering 50 production manipulators to Northrop Grumman. They're fielding on rovers that they build, one a division of Northrop called Remote Tech Builds, and we're fielding them. We're in Israel. We're doing we're doing live fire testing um, with the Israeli bomb squads. We're commissioning them. We're standing them up. We're working with them, and that's in hindsight at the time we didn't think you know we didn't think a lot of it. But looking back on it now, almost twenty years ago, I mean, who else was shipping? Nothing against all the. I mean. All the other robotics companies were doing technically harder problems, but in terms of fielding 50, 50 units. closed loop manipulators on a third party system that went into live fire, um, that That's was wild. That was exci- yeah. And again, at the time, especially when you're young, sometimes you don't realize how interesting the stuff you're doing is going to be in post. Yeah. Um, you just want to get it done. I was sick of it. I'm like, oh, this sucks. <laughs> I just want to get home. You know, I don't want, I don't want to be here. We, we, we'd come to, we were doing some work for the Israelis and then one of the other products went to Russia. It wasn't a robotics product, but it was a different one. And I can remember I came into work one day and this, this older fellow I worked with really good mechanical engineer, grizzled biker, <laughs> cool guy. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I came in one day. I'm like, what's up Harry? He's like, fuck. Harry's like, dude, what's wrong? He's like, Fuck. I'm like, what are you talking about? And this is in the day of paper airline tickets, right? This is <laughs> this is like 2004. So, um, especially if you're flying international, there's paper tickets. Yeah. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, haven't you been to your desk? I'm like, no, I just got here. I was getting a coffee. He's like, go to your desk. I'm go to my desk, and there's like, fuck <laughs> plane ticket. I'm like, I don't want to go to Russia. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, oh, we got a problem in Russia. Um, it was a small company. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was do that kind of, it was that kind of a company where it's like, yeah. Hey, we shipped some stuff to, like we said, it doesn't work till it works on the machine. Yeah. We shipped the gear to Russia. Something broke. So like three of us had to go to St. Petersburg. There's worse places to go. Yeah. St. Petersburg was cool. I've not been there yet. It seems cool. Like it's, I had that one mentor from there. But. It's really beautiful. I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's beautiful. I was a little concerned cause we were, we were doing work at a nuclear plant and, they had a big banquet and there was f- food there were fit there were big fish oh that's cool on, and on the on the the table you know on on the banquet table and it's just because of the heat in in like in the US you have to condition if you're going to discharge water from any any process plant manufacturing power generation anything you have to cool it before you discharge it <laughs> right if you're taking water out of a river to cool your process reactor, whether it's, again, power generation or you could be making baby food, right? You're taking, sure. taking water to cool. Warming it up, cool it, you, then put it back. You've got to put it back in the in the ecosystem. The same temperature you found within it. A, within a bandwidth. Yeah. Right. A little different over there. You know? Oh, interesting. So they were, they were dumping, not scalding hot, they were dumping hot water. So the fish grew big. <laughs> Wait, as a result of being the in heat, hot water? That's, the heat. That's it, interesting. It, it changed the ecosystem. That's really interesting. But if a little bit of a home, you know, a little bit of a Simpsons moment, we're like, this is a nuclear power plant. Like, why are these fish so big? <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was just. Yeah, so, fish. <laughs> yeah, it was. No, they, they were just big. Yeah. Um, so anyway, you worked for this small, like I said, we'd, we deployed <laughs> this stuff to Israel. Yeah. We had another product line that was, um, it was not robots like we think now. It was. Somewhat, somewhat automation for decontamination activities, yeah. but it wasn't like rover and manipulator. It was, it was automation for when you have to deal with contaminated pipes. So you're gonna you need a remote system to cut a pipe that you know that has contamination. You need a, you, need, you need essentially a robot, but it's really just a, a fixture. Yeah. yeah, it goes in and sort of sandblasts and cleans the inside of the pipe. Get rid of the contamination. Yeah. Um, and then s- make sure it's safe for guys to go in there. So well, when, that's interesting. Like if you have to cut, yeah, if you have to cut piping in th- that has contaminated, has radioactive water. Yeah. yeah. I learned I learned a bunch, you know, 
not enough to actually be useful for to actually work in the industry. But I learned a little bit about nuclear reactors. Oh, cool! And the in the U and the uh, the Russians still have some older reactors, an older style. They're yeah. safe. You know, it's not like Pripyat. It's not like yeah, it's not the Chernobyl thing. <laughs> um, but they have what are called bo- called boiling water reactors. So nuclear reaction boils the boils the water, makes steam. Steam's con- steam is radioactive, right? Because it's in in containment, right? Yeah, it's in with the reaction, and that goes through the turbine, right? That makes sense. That, that's how you make. That's all. Ra- that's all a nuclear power plant does is it boils water. That's the way it's been explained to me. That's all it does. It boils water. I was I was so let down when I learned that. <laughs> I thought it was so much cooler than that. But they um in a boiling water reactor, the only difference is the 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 high pressure steam goes through the uh the turbine. Yeah. To make the electricity. In a pressure water reactor, which we have in the US, as an extra sort of redundant layer, which is more expensive and more cons- uh, it's more expensive and more cumbersome the steam that's contaminated goes through a heat exchanger. Oh, that's interesting. So the contaminated water, the contaminated steam doesn't go through the, the turbine uh, itself. The turbine. Yeah. That's the only difference. So in, in Soviet plant or Russian plants. Oh, that's interesting. So, but that's got to be less efficient than the boiled water reactor. It is. But also less, you know. It's like, le- it's, what's, what's your trade off? It's less yeah. efficient, but then whenever you go to. You don't discharge pe- contaminated water. No, no, it's not. You're not discharging it. Whenever you go to PM it, like whenever, whenever the PM uh, periodic maintenance. Got it. Okay. Right. So whenever the turbine is at end of life, now the turbine is is radioactive. <laughs> Whereas if you have a heat exchanger, a heat exchanger has a much long life. A much but the heat longer, exchanger is radioactive, but it's but it's got a longer life. Because moving parts. Yeah, right. yeah, it's got a much longer lifespan. Yeah, that makes so sense. So it's just sort of. You know, the the U.S. plants were boiling water reactors originally. That's interesting. And then, you know, for whatever reason, you know. So anyway. They switched to a heat exchanger, and then they run that through the turbine? Yeah. yeah. So the, the, this this product this company had, um, you end up having to cut into, in, in again, 20 years ago, the Russian plant. You would you, still be boiling the water, right, on the other side oh, of the, the heat bo- exchanger? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The heat exchanger is still, essentially, the, heat, your, the water, the steam is so hot yeah. The heat exchanger is taking radioactive steam and boiling non-radioactive water into non-radioactive steam. Where the Russian plant all is doing. discharging hot radioactive Not water. Not discharging. No, 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 no. Okay. It's still a closed loop. Okay. It's still a closed loop. It's just whether or not the radioactive water, the radioactive steam goes through the turbine. Yeah. Or whether you have an extra, think of it like a How relay. do the fish get so hot then? <laughs> well, because the water that goes out, so... Yeah. When you say hot in a yeah. radi, you know, when you're oh, I see what you mean. Te- hot temperature, high temperature, high is, temperature is what I meant. Yeah, yeah. So when you, you know, because you have to, you have cooling towers. Whether no matter what kind of plant it is, yeah. you still have the, the cooling towers still have a even a second, you know, completely separate loop. Oh, I see. Okay. So you're taking water from a river. Yep. And you're using that to cool the process but that's not touching radioactivity no 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 yeah, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Sense. not radioactive yeah doesn't go anywhere near the reactor Whether, regardless probably. of what kind of yeah. plant yeah regardless of what kind of plant it is the cooling water is getting discharged is in in the u.s there's environmental laws that require you to make sure you're not discharging because if the water's too hot you just kill the fish yeah right it makes sense so you want to make sure that you're not negatively impacting the environment and you mean temperature hot not radioactive temperature hot, hot. not yeah. right ra- yeah not radioactive hot yeah that yeah. makes sense so. So anyway, company had some interesting quasi robots for when you got to cut that, you got to, you can't have guys cut that pipe because there's, even if you drain it inside of the pipe has, re, has re, residue, it's yeah. radioactive. Makes sense. So you got to have a, a robot that can cut, you know, again, a quasi robot, cut it and then reach in and sort of with an abrasive sponge, Yeah. you know, go back and, you know, sort of do that, that for 10, 12 feet pipe, you know, decontaminate the end of the pipe so that you get it to a, and then you test it and then you get it to a level where, where you can work on it. Oh, that's cool. You can put, you can put, you can put guys in there and the limits are safe. That's awesome. So that was the other product that this company did that again, 
was really, really cool, especially at the time. Now, nuclear is sort of out of fad. No one would think it was interesting. Yeah. But I worked for this little company, 40, 40, 45 people. Yeah. And again, production robots to the uh, Israeli government. And uh, like I said, these pipe and decon robots. Yeah. Quasi robots, more automated equipment than robots, really. Yeah, makes sense. Um, uh, to it in, in, into plants in Russia and in 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 the former Soviet republics. That's awesome. It was actually fun. It was funded by the U.S. DOE. Nice. Because they, you know, the Russians didn't. And again, you go back twenty years. You're you're only five or seven years out. I don't know from the collapse of the Soviet Union. <laughs> So the U.S. The U.S. Uh, was attempting to probably government was propping them up, do the right thing. Yeah, yeah. Like it's like, hey, you guys have these legacy plants. You don't have. Yeah, you. The U.S. did a lot there. That's a lot of things people don't don't realize now. That's it, interesting. It was, it, was, it was something really interesting to be involved in. So wait, so you went to Russia in the nineties? Well, they no no no. I went to I went there in probably two thousand three. Okay. Yeah. Was that still when the mob ran Russia? Like I, know I think that, the mob but, still runs Russia. Okay. Again, someone, Rob. <laughs> If, if my friend Rob Anderson is ends up watching this, I'll yeah. send him the link. I think I think they still run. <laughs> I think they still run. Yeah. Um, I can it's remember. Go, I can remember going. My friend John yeah. Biggs, I mentioned to you, who uh, old uh, former Gizmodo and TechCrunch guy. Cool. He uh, he lived in Warsaw for a number. Of years. Did undergrad with him. He lived in Warsaw. He met this really interesting guy um, who had spent a lot of time in Russia like in the emerging markets he's older than he's older than me so he he was probably going there in the mid 90s oh interesting yeah um told that was a crazy time there yeah oh yeah 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 Yeah. and that that was at the time where you know my understanding was you know if you're not with even if you're with a, a local you go into russia and even in the early aughts you know you get pulled over by the police and it's like, oh, we got to pay the Moscow tax. What does that mean? Oh, yeah. Raise some give, give give the guy forty euro. <laughs> okay, you know. So, <laughs> I think that's uh, I don't know. Was it in euros back then too? That's interesting. No, but they took euros. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, they 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 they, they preferred over rubles. every bribe I ever yeah. paid in in Russia was happily <laughs> accepted in euros, <laughs> nice. even twenty years ago. Uh, not that I've paid any. Um, <laughs> I had to bribe a cop in Morocco one time. It's yeah. yeah. Just to get to the airport on time. The guy pulled me over cause I was driving an expensive car and yeah. Well, I was at, again, I was, I was at, a, I was in war again. This is 20 years ago. I was in Warsaw and, uh, sort of at a, at a bar club kind of thing. And someone's coming up to me and trying to sell us drugs. I'm like, I don't want drugs. Um, and then a cop, so he's like, "Oh, I'm like, I'm like, oh, am I in trouble now?" And then a friend of ours who's who is Polish. I realized that the cop, the cop wasn't there to give me a hard time. The cop was there to make sure that if I wanted the drugs, I got them. Oh, that's hilarious! <laughs> and if I didn't, he'd get rid of the guy, and yeah. I, I was going to give him, you know, yeah, ten euro or something yeah. to, to to broker the deal. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, I'm good. He's like, "Do you you?" You want to talk to him? No, I don't. He's like, "Hey, get out of here!" I'm like, and then my buddy was like, "Give him, give him ten years. Here you go, sir." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> but I That's mean, it's hilarious. So either way, the guy gets ten euro. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. 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 But he's offering a service, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was nice. That guy didn't, you know, make sure it goes smoothly either direction you want it to go. Yeah. Weird guy in a puffy shirt didn't bother me for the rest of the night. So it was the best ten euro I've ever spent. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was from a robotic standpoint, that was really interesting and exciting. And after I left that company, I went to um, actually worked in medical device for a little while. Oh, cool. Um, small company that was doing CNC control of radiation delivery for uh, head and neck and then pelvic. Um, essentially, if you need radiation delivery to your to your for prostate. Yeah. Or if you had head and neck cancers. That's pretty cool. For whatever reason, and this is way above my pay grade at the time, thoracic cancers, the geometry was problematic. But huh. like things like your, things like, you know, if you've got, you know, you need to get uh, radiation to your prostate, what you ate the day before can can affect 
the position of your prostate, right? That's like, interesting. Like what's what's in your colon? It's yeah. getting a little, maybe a little off to off color. Surgery robot. That's how it goes. Yeah. I mean, what what's in? And, and the other thing is, if you have, if you've got a bowel cancer, you've got you're dealing with some of these sorts of things. You tend to be the kind of people who might have an impacted colon. So that yeah. was that was a real divergence where I went from you know brass. How do you tacks. track the location of a colon? Uh, ultrasound. Okay, that's pretty cool. You so can do that live while you're doing the surgery, or you do it once and you do the surgery and then you. Well, so it's not surgery; it's it's radiation. Um, I, I apologize. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. No, yeah. so good, good point. Very good, very good point. It was checking. I was actually talking a fellow who works for me works with me now, good friend of mine. Um, I met you know in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's a ro- small town in robotics, so I have people who hired me years ago who I've now. I don't want to say I hire, they don't work for me, but I, I've, I've advocated the hiring of them into Caterpillar. Yeah. Right. From this community. Cause you know, it's like this, this is a serious guy. He can get this shit done or this, the, he, this person, this girl knows she knows everything. She knows more than I'll ever forget about, you know, slam or perception based localization yeah. or whatever. Um, so yeah, I was just talking with this fellow who I, I worked at the med, I met at the medical device company who then hired me into RE squared. And then I advocated to bring in a Caterpillar years later. Oh, cool. Um, you know, about how, when we were piloting this technology, there was a radiation oncologist, like a nuclear physicist who didn't believe that the prostate could move that much based on what the person ate. Oh, and we showed them, it's like, Hey, it moved three centimeters. Your that's radiation would have missed pretty it. serious displacement. Yeah. I mean, when you're talking about the level of detail, you're, you're setting you have to radiation. hit it from a bunch of angles, right? In order to yeah. So the, if you think yeah. about, you know, if you know, I learned this working there. I I never knew this before, but yeah, getting radiation, the the thing sort of moves around you this way. Yeah. And then there's a device. So you don't irradiate the surrounding tissue as much as you would if you stayed in one place. And it's and it's and it's a cumulative dose. Yeah. Right. So you describe discrete geom. It's a geometric problem. Yeah. Discrete geometry in the body, and then you have something that is. You know, sort of like the old fashioned, like if you watch a silent movie and they have a scope and they have like something that makes it look like a, a duck, you know, the dark space around the picture. Huh. So you have essentially that idea, but you it's very low grade NC. You have uh, these tungsten NC. leaves that can move. You've got maybe 72 leaves and they can move halfway back or all the way back. So you think of all the permutations you have, a pattern you can generate. Yeah. And at each step as you move around the body. Oh, that's and pretty cool. you look at the, you know, you do the ray tracing, you know, that's why it matters exactly where that geometry is. So yeah, it was, it was a really cool company. That's really, awesome. really cool technology. Um, as tends to be the case, uh, target of a terrible acquisition. Ah, brutal. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, I, we, we, myself and this other fellow I work with say, you know, if that company hadn't been bought, or at least bought by the company who bought it, we wanted to retire out of that company. It was so cool. Yeah. Cool tech, cool people, uh, smart, brutally smart people, and a great mission. That's awesome. Um, but anyway, yeah, I went to work there, and then there was a sort of a kind of a bad acquisition. Um, and I went to work for RE Squared. Well, I think, no, I'm sorry. I went to work for Applied Perception right as they were getting getting acquired. I was, um, when they were getting acquired by Foster Miller. Oh, interesting. So I worked for them for a number of years, learned a lot, worked with, I worked, I worked for Prague there. Prague is a great guy. That's cool. Um, yeah, I like that guy a lot. Very pragmatic. Yeah. Very pragmatic. Very, you know, you butt heads. Yeah. When it went out at the end of the day, I was one of the few. He's got a bit of an ego, but he's a good dude. It wasn't ego. It was, it was, it was the typical, I mean, I, that was very much a software shop. Right. Yeah. I mean, their business model was built on, you know, 90 you, percent. You're going to you're going to add perception to a, a machine that didn't have perception before. Yeah. Truck, tank, a small unmanned ground vehicle, a talon from Foster Miller. Yeah. It's a 90 percent of a software problem. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize Kinetic acquired Foster Miller. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, Foster Miller. And I think it all happened around this. My, again, Prague will tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah. There was, hey, it was uh, <laughs> all around the same sort of time. I started working with them in Sorry, I like said you 2007. <laughs> uh, you, you know what? Yeah. He, he couldn't have done what he's done without one. Yeah. Right. 
you know, he, he, I worked for him there and then he founded, you know, he built NAIA systems from scratch and sold it. And yeah. Still, still, still technically engaged. Yeah. I mean, does he have an ego? Sure. Did he earn it? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah no, I mean, he's, he's great. I love Prague. Yeah. You're not, you're not going to do what he did by saying, Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, but yeah, I worked for them for a while and then, um, yeah, I went to work for RE Squared after that. Worked That's for cool. RE Squared for a few. Worked on some really cool things there. Um, RE Squared was great because it was the first place I worked where we had an in-house. In-house what? Our, in-house shop. Okay, cool. Like, it, RE Squared was the first robotics company I worked at where the hardware was on equal footing with import with the software. Yeah, for sure. And that was really exciting. Now, software guys might say that was the problem. But I mean that—that's the natural tension between. Ari Square is awesome. Those guys they are, are great as well. They yeah. are. They are. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. I always. We always. You know, this fellow I work with now, Bob. You know, we always say, you know, one day Jurgen's gonna hit it out of the park, and I was like, oh, look at this guy make make how many millions of dollars overnight? It's gonna be like the twenty year overnight success. <laughs> that's and, what he calls himself. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, I mean, they, 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 he grounded out, and and I, I respect the hell out of him. Yeah. Same. Um, but it was the it was the first place where the hardware and the software were sort of on an, on a level playing field. Yeah, um, which was really exciting for me. Yeah, um, for sure. I said worked there for a few years, and then the uh, the uh, my background. If you go back to what we talked about, sort of where I came from, what I learned, what I did, my background was I think better suited for systems and integration than deep deep detailed mechie yeah it makes sense and some of the stuff i was working on at re squared i think i was getting a little frustrated with because it was stressing me in areas that maybe i was again I'm, at this point i'm 15 years into my career and I'm, i keep finding areas i'm a little light in yeah um but it was very very hard very very deep mechatronic simulation and analysis and i was a little you know and i i kind of found this this fit at cat where they had a it was more of a systems uh, systems engineering problem set than a deep, deep sort of hardcore. Hey, I got a you know masters plus twenty in mechanics of deformable solids kind of kind of problem. Yeah, makes or sense. deep design for manufacture. Yeah. Um, so I yeah I went I went to Caterpillar. It's been about twelve. You know, I left for a little while. Went there in twenty twelve. Left for a little while. Um, the economy got soft. There were some issues. I worked for myself for a little while, which is why I say I really respect what you're doing. Thank you so much. Sometimes just getting paid is a uh, a full time job in itself. Oh, for sure. Uh, um, been there. And then I yeah, I've been back there uh, for about five and a half years now. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, when I worked at Joy Global, we always regarded Caterpillar as like, you know doing better than us <laughs> like i mean well you guys were like we were trying to fast follow cat i mean is, is basically what it was i think in the space that joy owned yeah joy was the leader but it was an older space joy was really really heavy and underground especially coal yeah right? um i mean saw, i worked in surface so i guess i didn't see right that side but as it, much. and then the other side on the surf you know on the surface mining stuff, but you got to remember, Cat didn't. When did you work for Busire or work uh, for Joy? 2014. Okay, so you got to remember, Cat didn't. Cat bought Busiris in 2010, maybe. Yeah, it was. I guess someone just before I. I got RVP there. Carl Weiss, if he watches, I'll send you the link. You can correct me on this. Yeah. Um, but before Cat bought Busiris, Cat really didn't have a huge play in serve they, they had a huge pl play in service mining in terms of trucking yeah large wheel loaders large dozers but like the big stuff that you guys probably built like the rope yeah. shovels yep the heavy the huge big heavy stuff Those that drag only drag lines yeah drag drag lines rope shovels um even hydraulic mining shovels cat yeah. had a hydraulic you know the difference between a between a between a um an excavator and a shovel i do not so an excavator curls in yeah and a shovel curls out oh that makes sense so yeah, that's what we were doing like the big rope shovels yeah. curl out so yep. a big hydro a hydraulic mining shovel on paper is nothing but a but an 
you know, uh, an excavator on steroids with its bucket backwards. That's interesting. And that's what Cat thought, but it's it, you know when you, you know, when you get to that scale, things are different. So yeah, like the hydraulic mining shovel that Cat has, that's big enough to feed the big. That trucks, is what I love about Joy Cyrus. was the scale and like yeah. the just the crazy large vehicles that we got to work on. Yes, yeah. that was. I've never been anywhere else that was building stuff that big. Oh, yeah. Seeing those, seeing the rope shovels, seeing the drag lines, it, it's, it is interesting. Yeah. But yeah, it's funny. You say you're following Cat, but Cat had only kind of bought into that space five yeah, years. Yeah, but on the autonomy prior. side, I think Cat was, was yeah. way ahead of Joy, at least at that point in history. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we, I, I don't, and I can't speak to what they were doing in the underground space with the Osiris acquisition. Yeah. I know when I was an undergrad, like I said, I worked at field robotics and then I, I ended up finishing out working at, um, at the, at NREC when it first opened. Oh, cool. Like, I mean, first opened like the, the one bay was, wasn't even finished. Like it was just the, the nice bay that you walk into now, kind of where the elevator is and you look down there, that was all painted. But if you open any of the doors, they were just empty rooms, like, <laughs> like unbuilt, um, very early. But there was a joy. There was a joy program there. Oh, I didn't know that. That's yeah, like really 19, interesting. This would have been 1998, maybe. Okay. A continuous miner. Yeah. So that was actually. Those after, are cool machines. Oh, they they they're yeah they're really cool. Yeah. But that was the that, I worked on that project. I went from field robotics to NREC, uh, again as a work study part time as I'm finishing my undergrad, working on working on that. Um, got to go into some underground mines. Got trained as a miner. It was kind of kind of weird. <laughs> um, so yeah, but I think when you guys were chasing it, where Joy was, Komatsu's acquisition of Joy makes sense. That's interesting. Right? How if so? You think, um, well, they bought later. Yeah, true. Uh, it was complimentary because so there were some things that by the time Komatsu bought bought uh joy coal had sort of peaked and had been, it was coming down so where cat might have paid a premium for some of that technology joy or uh komatsu, komatsu, did komatsu didn't and komatsu has a has a very strong and robust autonomy uh program that's true right yeah. they had acquired modular mining uh a long time ago you know, they had done like an, uh, an acquisition of some of their autonomy capabilities and they're doing great things on their own. I mean, they're a competitor, but you don't pretend that they're not, uh, reasonable. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, I think that acquisition, the sorts of things that joy was working on at that time didn't make sense to automate in terms of some of the underground stuff. And if you look at the, uh, the automation that's happening in the huge, the big surface stuff you were working on, it's more about collaboration in my mind than about, you know, you don't need to automate a rope shovel. Yeah. Right. You need to make sure that that rope shovel loads the truck really fast. That's interesting. And we did that's model right. your guys's 400 pound haul trucks in our lab to get it to work correctly. Right. And there's, uh. and in my understanding talking to, I do, I, I, I used to do a lot of voice of customer where I talk to customers, you know, yeah. There are, there are, there are things that the Komatsu trucks, you know, we deal with mixed fleet all the time. Cat makes blast hole drills. So does Atlas Copco. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know Atlas and was in that market. Atlas, so Atlas makes the blast hole drills yeah. um, that are blasting at those big mines. And, uh, you know, some mines, some, you know, you come out with a really cool autonomy stack. Mine's got like 20 Copco drills. I don't know if they're going to buy 20 new drills. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, you have mixed fleet out there. Yeah. But I think for you guys, I think probably the reason you guys might have felt at that time, or you might have felt working in service mining you were following, was that when Komatsu bought them, it sort of brought the, the ballet together of, you know, big surface mining and big trucks, right? Komatsu had the trucks. Yeah. Komatsu was working on autonomy. Same way Cat, Cat bought Bucyrus, Cat had the trucks are a very successful autonomy program. I don't know how many, I forgot what the statistics are now, six, 800 production haul trucks going oh, wow. around the world. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so like that combination, same way it was for, for, for us, for cat, I think that combination was right because it was the, it was the right balance, you know, yeah, you the, the right amount of autonomy, yeah, at that point, it's 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 a it is an operations research project, right? Right. How many seconds can you shave off of a cycle time? Yeah. Equates to how many millions of dollars a year? Yeah. It's 
textbook operations research. Yeah, that makes sense. So that's cool. Yeah. Should we call it before we uh, we draw this out too long? Yeah, whenever you want. I, like I said, I don't I don't do these a lot. So no, 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 it's all good. I'm, I'm just trying thinking, to treat this just as a conversation. So whenever we're, we're, it's a good conversation, but we're at two hours ten minutes. Oh, let's so be done. I feel yeah. like yeah, I don't want to bore bore everybody more yeah. than we have. But um, so. no, this was cool. I I, I really enjoyed uh, doing this. Uh, thank you for coming cool. on, and we should grab a drink and dinner. I'm sure we will. All right. All right. Okay. Thanks a lot, Spencer. Thank you, Lou. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krause is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krause is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SK Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SK Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.